hundred or so mail ballots that we sent out back. Um, the new ballot drop boxes being well used and uh, um, you know, we are emptying it a couple of different times a day. It does fill up quickly and people are definitely utilizing that, I'd say even more than the US mail. Clark Stats, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry to disrupt yeah. you. I, I did announce that we're being recorded by NORCAM, but Mr. Healy wants us to give permission to record. So uh, as, as far as the members are, uh, are the members all set with, uh, are all the members accepting, can we let him record, which we normally do. Mr. O'Leary, are you okay with that? Absolutely. Mr. Studo, yes. Mr. Walner, yes. Mrs. Gonzalez, yes. yes. Phil, it's okay to record us. We thought you were doing that anyway. Mrs. Uh, Madam Clerk, can you rewind and start from the beginning so Phil can capture all of that as well? All right. As, as I said, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, well into the election period right now. We've mailed out over 4,600 ballots and are, they are coming back fast and furiously. Um, so we are in, of course, week one of early voting. And we started on Saturday. We had four hours on Saturday and Sunday as well. And we were open for early voting from 8.30 to 3.30 today. And in total, we've had 575 early voters at this point. So um, we're right now trying to um, formulate a plan for election day voting at the church to uh, make sure that we follow proper procedures and safety protocols under COVID conditions to make sure that the safety of all the voters and the workers is uh, recognized. So I'm working closely with the police department on that and um, we will have a plan in place. We actually do have uh, procedures in place and we will get those out to the public shortly. All right, any questions? No, Mr. O'Leary. Um, I had a couple of um, residents indicate to me that there was um, an individual standing by the, the uh, drop-off ballot box, um, arms crossed, you know, observing the activity uh, right very close proximity to it. Has there been any request by any candidates or political party for official observers either inside or outside the polling place? During early voting, Mr. O'Leary? Correct. No, there has not. Uh, have you been made aware that there were people standing by the uh, drop-off ballot box outside town hall? Not at all. No yeah. one had mentioned anything to us, or I, I don't believe they mentioned anything to the early voting workers, or I'm sure they would have related to me. Yeah, this was out. This was outside, standing by the yep. uh, the drop-off box. So, uh, again, I didn't know. Uh, again, a couple of residents indicated their discomfort uh, with it, and I didn't know if uh, how were they were they dropping off their ballots at yes, that time? Is that what they were ballot. doing? Yep, yep. Dropping off their ballot, you know, outside town hall. Um, yeah. Well, they didn't. They didn't come in or contact me to make me aware of it. Um, you know where or we would have tried to monitor that a little bit i don't know i don't know the instance mr o'leary was it over the weekend or yes yeah i believe it was um maybe it's saturday it was maybe saturday. you know i don't know with all of the um news media focusing on ballot drop boxes maybe they were trying to look to make sure it was secure i'm not sure what well, this was this was you know there was no it wasn't news media it was uh no, I'm, I'm just saying a resident might have been had heightened awareness because of news media and was just looking at our box to see if they utilized it, perhaps. Would it be secure? Yeah, okay. I, I wish they had spoken to me. What would the protocol be as far as someone standing by the um, drop-off box? Is there any we have, we, Nothing that I'm aware of that would prevent people it would be just like them standing in front of town hall. 
unless they were with a campaign and they were trying to intimidate voters, we would need to know that. Right. We the registrars have a policy in place for early voting that prevents electioneering within 25 feet of any entrance, where, as I'm sure you are aware at the polls, it's 150 feet. Um, we can't go that far, but we did make a regulation for 25 feet, but that would be for electioneering. I'm not sure what these this person was doing. No, they weren't either, other than standing there with their arms crossed, somewhat intimidating. Um, individual but that's all I, I just wanted to make you aware if you weren't aware and no i wasn't I wish of it and you may want to ask the police officers or the police department if they were made aware if, of it. if you could reach out to the person that made you aware and have them contact me i would appreciate it yeah okay i'll see if they're willing to do that thank uh, you that's great mrs gonzalez is there a camera out there i'll let the, my, uh, the town administrator speak to that there are um, there are security cameras here at the town hall. So we would be able to look back on that. I'd have to look further, um, you know, at the uh, at the system. But if we had specific information about a date and time, it would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Madam Thank Chair. You. Yes, Mr. Alberto. I will add that there were a number of us out front of the building during the business day on Friday. Um, just evaluating the way things were functioning at that spot. Um, I don't believe, I believe everybody who showed up to cast their ballot at that time was able to freely access it though. So I, I don't, it doesn't sound like this instance that's being cited was tied to that. It sounds like it was more of a single individual. Yeah. Just, it, it, just uh, Madam Chair, if I might, you know, so how many, um, uh, Barbara, in relation to, um, you had, you mailed out 4,600 ballots and that's unbelievable it's fantastic um what percentage have you received back and you said most of it's by um, drop off as opposed to mail yes i would say you know most of it is definitely through the drop box i couldn't give you a, a figure yet i haven't run a report on that um we've been so busy processing them to get them online so that if people want to track their ballot, they can see it. So I, I don't have that figure in front of me right now. And in relation to the ballots that are uh, that are dropped off and the ones that are early voting, how are those to be processed as far as um, how they're going to be counted? Well, we're looking at options, different options. For the primary, we handled all of that at the polling place. Um, in lieu of uh, checkout workers, we had um, our workers at those stations actually processing all of those ballots into the ballot box. Um, the chapter 115 of the acts of 2020 does give some options for clerk's offices in processing these and we're looking at all the options right now to make sure we can um, choose the one that will best suit the needs for North Reading and allow for um, smooth access at the polls and unfettered access to so, the so ballot box. So I guess I missed the. So the ones that are early voting, yeah, are those being counted, run through a machine? Already, not at this point. No ballot can be run through a machine, especially early voted ballots have to. A lot of people question that because they feel that it should just go into a machine, but the state law doesn't allow that. They have to be sealed in an affidavit envelope. And then we just process them through the state computer system to acknowledge we've received it. That goes on the tracking uh, platform of the Secretary of State's office. Um, and then they're all stored in the vault temporarily, of course, until either we um, initiate uh, uh, an advanced processing uh, process as allowed under the law or same day um, election processing. What's, what's but, the option? What's the option in relation to early processing? Well, that can start uh, next week and it is, it has to be, of course, a lot of uh, paperwork documenting the, the process. Um, the ballots would be um, advanced removed from their affidavit envelope by a team and then at, they may or may not be advanced processed through a tabulator at that time. 
without running any result. No results from any tabulator machine could be run until 8 p.m. November 3rd. Okay. And you haven't decided yet whether you're going to process early or not? I'm, I'm, I am leaning that way, Mr. O'Leary. I'm getting teams in place right now, and I want to uh, get all of my information ready. We are constantly in touch with the Secretary of State's Office Elections Division to get the best updates we can, and um, that decision, I have time to make that decision. Just as a matter of information, my wife and I voted early uh, Saturday, and mm -hmm. uh, and it, and it, the process went very well. Uh, and I appreciate the, the person at the tail end of the process uh, licking the envelope for us and not literally licking it, but you know. <laughs> yes, they had a sealer. <laughs> yeah, the it sealer. Felt, because that, you right. Know, made Normally, it at all previous early voting that's taken place, we had, except for September, we had sealers at every voting booth for the individuals to seal their own ballots. And then with COVID at the September primary, we couldn't do that because we would have to be sanitizing those handheld. Right. No, but, it, um, but it, I just wanted to state that it, that it, went, it went very smoothly <laughs> and very well. And, and for my wife and I, we were uh, appreciative of the opportunity to uh, avail ourselves of it, and get our ballots in, get it done, and uh, we'll just wait for the results. But uh, it went very well on Saturday for us and I uh, appreciate it very much. Okay, Madam Clerk, I think as we move on to the next agenda item, mm -hmm. I think that has to do with your department as well. Right. So right. you're hanging in there for that I one. I am. <laughs> Our next order of business is appointments, Election Workers Recycling Committee, Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Um, Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, uh, through you, the town clerk had submitted a listing of election workers for uh, appointment to um, work at uh, the upcoming election or ongoing election. Um, she then submitted a revised listing today. There were, I believe, three individuals, Barbara, that opted not to be considered. Yes, um, that's correct. For appointment. Um, so uh, if folks haven't seen it, there is an updated listing that's in there along with an updated motion. Um, Vincenzo, hopefully you have access to that in the shared yeah, folder. I have it. Okay, okay, so do I have a motion? Yes, we do. <clears throat> Madam Chair, I move to appoint additional election workers for the current appointment period in accordance with Section 12 of Chapter 115 of the Acts of 2020 as requested by the town clerk in a revised memo dated October 19, 2020. Okay. I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? So just in, in relation to the number, Barbara, how many more are you adding on? And this is 24. Yeah. And they, they I, I really didn't even solicit them. They actually started volunteering, I think, as soon as, um, I think there was an information in the Red Book distributed by the Secretary of State's office and, uh, of course, media um, just out there to say to, you know, people want to volunteer, they should, uh, reach out to their uh, local elections division. And so these, all these people just came forward. Um, and I think the reason, you know, some of them dropped out now is because their schedules had changed at the time that they uh, requested to uh, come on board. Their work schedule may have been different than it is now. And so, um, you know, they, they just are not able to do it now. And these, these people will be um, mostly used as, I'm going to call them monitors in directing voters to their correct precincts um, outside of the actual polling place. Um, we're, as I said, we're working closely with the police department to make sure we have proper spacing and traffic flow within the foyer and the hall. And we're counting on these new workers to help us with that, to just um, keep that going smoothly and safely. In, in, in relation to the uh, additional workflow that you've had to date and looking forward, um, how much additional personnel have you put on and, and what do you anticipate election day to look like? 
Well, other than these um, 24 new, um, I'll call them volunteers, um, we had uh, other newer election workers appointed already this year, and we're utilizing, you know, ev everyone we can. And uh, as far as, you know, I'm not anticipating actually the uh, election day activity. It's certainly not going to be what it has been in past presidential years because of the um, openness of voting by mail this year. So with 4,600 and growing numbers of ballots having been mailed out, the opportunity for early voting for the full two week period, including weekends, um, that will dramatically reduce the number of in-person voters on election day. Uh, there are always a number of people who um, apply for a mailed ballot and sometimes that's as a backup so that in case they weren't feeling well on election day or during the early voting period or in case there was a greater outbreak of the COVID that limited their ability to engage socially outdoors, um, they would have their mailed ballot. But as we've already seen right now, we have uh, 90 people out of the 575 who have voted early had applied for a mailed in ballot. So that's 90 mailed ballots that will not be returned because those voters voted in person. So we have a lot of crossover here, but certainly we, we will have not the heightened um, activity on election day of voters as we normally do, you know, for you know, like four years ago or four years before that when we could have 80 to 85% of the voters turn out. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. So I have a motion by Mr. Stu Studo and I believe Mr. O'Leary seconded it, right? Okay, any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Emmanuelli is aye. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, clerk stats. Thank and you. We have more appointments and motions. Mr. Studo. Madam Chair, I move to place in nomination the following name for appointment as members of the recycling committee for indefinite terms, Usha Pilai, I hope I said that right, I'm sorry if I didn't, Frank Falcone. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo, a second by Mrs. Gonzalez. Uh, two nominations and for Mr. Gilberto, two, how many positions are currently open? You're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I believe that the number of vacancies is three um, for the recycling committee at this point in time. Um, but uh, if I have that wrong, I would certainly stand to be corrected. Thank you. And so we'll hear from Mrs. Gonzalez. <laughs> Are you our liaison, Mrs. Gonzalez? And did you? Okay. Can we hear you? Yes. <laughs> I can see you, but I wasn't sure if you froze. No, I'm not froze. I just, I'm not sure what uh, the motion was made. So. So you're recommending that we appoint both of these nominated individuals? I am recommending. Okay. All right. So I have a motion. By Mr. Studo, I have a second by Mrs. Gonzalez. Any further discussion? Uh, the term is it in, is, what are the terms? Are they indefinite? Or? Indefinite. Okay. All Madam right. Chair, yes, Mr. I do Gilbert. stand to be corrected. The number of vacancies is two, according to the Board and Commission Information System on the Town Clerk website. So it's full. I yeah. believe this would put it at a, at a full complement. Yes. Whether all the members are active, I don't know, but according to the roster here, there are two vacancies, both for um, a uh, on no expiration term. Okay. All right. So, Mr. Studo, the, can you can you state the names again for us? It'll be a roll call vote. Um, Usha Pillai. 
Mm -hmm. and Frank Falcone. All right. So we have a motion, second, and no further discussion. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. For both. Mr. Walner. Aye. For both. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. For both. Mr. Studo. Aye. For both. And Manu Pelli is aye for both. Okay. We have our next order of business, which is uh, Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Is there a motion, Mr. Studo? Yes, there is. Madam Chair, in accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 40B, Section 24, I move to appoint town planner Danielle McKnight as the town of North Reading's representative to the Metropolitan Planning Council and town administrator Michael Gilberto as the alternate representative for three year for three year terms to expire October 19, 2023. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seems like the logical choice, right? Um, so no, seeing no further discussion, Mr. O'Leary. Aye, to both. Okay, Mr. Walner. Aye to both. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye to both. Mr. Studo. Aye to both. And Manny Pelli is aye to both. All right. Our next order of business is to sign the state presidential election warrant. Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, through you to the board members, this is a, a, a vote that is required in order for the uh, November 3rd state election to formally be called here in North Reading. As has been the case for previous uh, warrants, um, we'll be asking to coordinate a, a date, hopefully this week, for the board members to all come in on the same day to sign the document in hard copy as is required so that the constable can then post it. And I believe the town clerk remained on the call for purposes yes. of coordinating that date. <laughs> yes, she is. All right. So I have, um, do I have a motion? Did we hear a motion? I'm sorry. I'm uh, yeah. Well. Not yes. Let's hear a motion. <laughs> Madam Chair, I move to sign the November 3rd, 2020 state presidential election warrant. Second. I have. A motion by Mr. Studo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. So is there, do, is there a particular day we might be able to all go, um, to, to go sign? Tomorrow is best for me, tomorrow morning for me, but I don't know about everybody else. I can get in tomorrow. I can get in tomorrow morning. I can do it early. Can, can, can we try for Thursday or Friday? I could do... I won't be here tomorrow, so... I can do Friday. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Is, I can that, do is that all right, Mr. O'Leary? I know you said not Friday doesn't work for you. You see it. All right. Yeah. Okay. Morning. I'll be there morning. Friday morning. Um, that's fine, right, Mr. Gilberto? That works with the timeline, right? I would ask the town clerk just to confirm that there's sufficient time for the warrant to be posted. Yes, there there would be. I'll have to notify the constable, and um, maybe he can even pick it up Friday after everyone signs it. Okay. So Friday morning. Thank you for your accommodation. Um, all right, so Friday we'll all sign, and please, please send us a reminder. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you, Madam Clerk. Our thank next you. order of business is a COVID-19 update. Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, very briefly, I'll just let the board members know we continue to monitor the case uh, information on an ongoing basis in addition to the weekly public health report that's put out by the state on Wednesday evenings. Um, over the past couple of weeks, we've seen consecutive weeks of 14 new cases over the previous 14 day period. That has left us with a 6.0% uh, um, positivity uh, rating 
for, excuse me, 6.0% um, case uh, load, which has kept us in the yellow designation over the course of the past two weeks. Um, we have had a couple of instances of cases um, so, uh, occurring in the, uh, in the public schools. Um, however, we have not had a case um, where, where there has been a, uh, at to this point, any transmission associated with those cases in the public schools. Um, it has been resulting uh, quarantine requirements, which have occurred um, in, uh, in those schools for specific cohorts of specific classes or grade levels. And um, that is being handled between the superintendent of schools, the, the health director, the public health nurse, and the school nurses. Um, I know that something that is very much on everybody's mind is the upcoming or ongoing um, Halloween um, you know, activities and we put information out on the town website relative to what are the sort of high, medium and low risk activities. I know the question that, uh, you know, has certainly been circulating out there is tied to um, traditional trick or treating. And uh, as I mentioned in our last update, you know, we are looking at trying to um, provide and incorporate the CDC and DPH guidance relative to how trick or treating uh, could occur and barring uh, any substantial change in the town's position relative to COVID-19 activity, our hope is that it would be able to continue, um, albeit altered um, by the, this uh, guidance. And so um, there may be some detail coming out on that from uh, multiple departments uh, later this week. Um, but um, as I, we've been saying all along, obviously the situation is, uh, is fluid and the data changes on um, sometimes a daily basis. So we're gonna to need to continue to monitor it. Um, but I know people are looking for some, some information. You know, the short answer is we are still you know, looking to see trick-or-treating occur here in North Reading on Halloween, although um, with some modifications to it, the most notable one of which is um, really trying to avoid any of that person-to-person -person interaction in large groups, um, which can often go with the traditional uh, trick-or-treating exercises. But there will be more to come on that um, at, a, at a point later on, uh, potentially later this week. Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. Any questions? Yes, the, the Board of Health is meeting tomorrow night. Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. So the Board of Health is meeting tomorrow night and they'll be addressing some of the uh, some of those topics, I guess they'll be discussing it. In addition to uh, the increase in the cases here, there's obviously concern in relation to, you know, the number of uh, individuals that could be in certain types of business establishments. I think the Board of Health will be discussing that. Also, whether there be some remedial action. I'm sorry, Mr. O'Leary. I don't. I apologize for interrupting you, Mr. Gilberto. Can you uh, mute everybody because someone's connection is just. I. It's actually disrupting Mr. O'Leary's discussion here. And we can unmute you again. Yeah, I would say is the Board of Health will be meeting tomorrow night. We're going to be discussing uh, a number of these issues, you know, at length. And I know the uh, town administrator has been in uh, lengthy discussions with the uh, health uh, agent, the public health nurse. And again, I want to acknowledge uh, the uh, public health nurse's uh, code red alert that went out uh, last week. That was uh, very helpful and informative. Um, but again, people need to be aware that, um, you know, we're still in the midst of this thing and that, um, if we don't do our part, you know, the Board of Health may be forced to take some additional actions in relation to curtailing activities within our business establishments uh, even more than they're uh, being curtailed now. So just be cognizant of it. Um, you know, while we're all very anxious to, to get through this, uh, we've got a long way to go still, and we need to just, just do our part. So the Board of Health will be meeting again tomorrow night. Uh, I'll be participating in that uh, discussion too. And as the town administrator said, there'll be more information forthcoming probably later this week. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Any other comments or questions? Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, there's 14 new cases reported. Um, about a month ago, Mr. Gilberto, you said that they were um, putting probable cases in with the count. So are any of those probables in that 14 or are those all confirmed? Um, I, I, the short answer is I don't know offhand, Mrs. Gonzalez, and I, I'm not sure whether 
from a medical standpoint, we're being given the information to distinguish between the two. Um, so I, I'd have to I'd have to check with the public health nurse, but I, I don't. The short answer is I don't know offhand. Okay. Mr. Studo. Hi. Uh, this is a question, and actually, to Mr. Gilbert and Mr. O'Leary, because you're the liaison, you may know. But um, when the when the Board of Health makes a decision, any decision, do they base it on confirmed or probable? And I only ask because you know there there are some decisions that may come down that affect you know people that you know we're all close to in this town very significantly. So. I just wonder is is the con are we basing decisions on confirmed or probable? Like I don't know if if you guys know that I haven't been part of any of the health meetings, so I don't know. Um, I mean, I can tell you that what 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 I think is happening is that these confirmed cases are are being presented to us. These, these probable cases are being presented to us as if they are confirmed. So I, again, I'm not sure that we have the ability to distinguish between the two. Um, but what what I can tell you is that you know from a you know a, a discussion and an operational standpoint, the discussions amongst the core you know COVID response team, including the the two chiefs, the health director, the superintendent of schools, and the public health nurse, has been to to understand where the transmission is occurring, um, and we certainly will make that information available to the board of health for um, for its discussions. And um, you know how they choose to you know act with that. I think is something that is you know yet to be seen. Um, they've had some initial discussion about potential restrictions, but it was really preliminary. Um, you know there, there may be more discussion you know tomorrow evening. I'm not sure whether much will have changed in the in the eyes of the the board of health members. I guess I would also add that you know when I, when the, the public health nurse has commented upon you know where are we kind of seeing the general transmission is occurring in. In North Reading, the the response has been um, you know, individuals uh, who are um, you know, being exposed and becoming um, a positive case for, by virtue of their work, uh, and then also um, the um, family you know, household transmission as well. Those seem to be two pr you know, primary drivers that we've been hearing um, hearing about. Um, but I don't want to prejudge the discussion of the Board of Health before they've had it, so uh, it's hard for me to predict, um, but we will try to get uh, at our regular meeting tomorrow morning a better understanding. I will try to get a better understanding of, you know, do we even know that the presumed cases are in fact presumed when they're, or are they just being dumped, you know, not presented to us as confirmed? We'll try to get that answer. Thank you. Mr. Thank Gilberto, you. Uh, is the Board of Health uh, data coming from DPH? Yes, um, so our caseload comes, um, from the Mass Department of Public Health's uh, MAVEN system, which is a database that public health nurses are able to access um, the data from. That's the sort of first point of information. And then there's this lag in information that comes through the state's reporting numbers. So um, there's yet to be a moment in time when those numbers have been the same um, throughout the eight months we've been going through this. And it's been at times a, a source of frustration, but we have been told that it is due to a lag in data from some of the testing sites. You know, it gets right into Maven, but it doesn't get to the state reporting um, information um, right away. Um, there are uh, isolated um, instances where we get alerted to a case that's not come in through Maven. So somebody calls the health department or calls the public health nurse, but they're not necessarily in Maven. But I can't think, I'm not aware of instances where the person who is a resident of North Reading has not ended up, you know, up in that state reporting system within a day or so of that happening. Are you aware of, um, because a DPH, the online dashboard is reporting confirmed cases and probable deaths resulting from confirmed cases and then independently probable cases. Are you aware of the reported numbers being significantly different when you, from the numbers that, that, that our Board of Health has? In other words, is there some sort of a significant gap that would that you could assume is because of uh, probable cases versus what, what they have for confirmed cases on the dashboard? Uh, there was a point where I, I thought that that was the explanation, but um, from what I've been told it, that the explanation of the lag, which has been at times 20 to 24 cases, depending upon the week, um, that, that it's actually associated with the reporting and, and not classification. 
Um, but I, I've not heard that yet. Um, that could be a great answer if it is the explanation. I just have not heard it yet. Okay. Okay. And I think Mr. Walner, do you have any questions? You're all set. Okay. It is a, you know, a definitely difficult time. It's a scary time for people. I just want to thank the school department, the superintendent, and all of the administration because they're they were right on top of alerting the parents about what's going on and trying to keep us informed and advised because. We have our kids there, we have our beloved teachers there and uh, all of the people in the school system. So we do want to take whatever containment measures there are to, to keep everybody safe. So we thank, thankfully they are, they are people of plans and planning. So they were able to alert us right away. And we wish that anybody who is a confirmed case has a rapid recovery from the, um, the virus. All right, so we're going to move along to our next order of business, which is um, public comment. All right, I usually skip over that, Mr. Walner, right? Mr. Walner has to remind me to go back to it. So we have a lot of participants today. Let's see if there's any hands up. I don't intentionally skip over it. No, you got a lot of things to do. <laughs> we have a lot of business in addition to that business. All right, I don't see any hands raised. Mr. Gilberto, did you wanna maybe unmute the this one individual joining us by phone? I guess, I don't know if that individual wants to make any public comment. And I see no nothing in the chat room other than uh, Mr. Healy's recording. We're good? I'm going to nope. briefly unmute all, Madam Chair, if that's okay. And no, I that's can't... okay. No, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Do you want me to unmute all for the? Well, moment? can you unmute the individual joining us by phone? Because that would be the only person that can't raise their hand. It might be Jane. Oh, that is Jane. Oh, I'm it's sorry. Oh, okay. oh, no, it's Jane's phone. We got Jane's oh. phone. Someone else. It's not, it's not Jane, no. Um, no, I have Jane. I, I've got Jane. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm going to ask the person to unmute because I can't physically unmute them myself. All right. We'll just give the individual an opportunity and I guess not. I believe that that's Ms. Doherty. I'm trying to be anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do I have, have an anonymous join this. All right. I'm sorry, Ms. Doherty. We just, wanted to, we just wanted to make sure that whoever thank, was thank joining you. us appreciated okay. it. All right, so we're going to move on to the next order of business, which is board member reports. Mr. O'Leary, take it away. Just uh, again, uh, my two busiest assignments right now are the uh, water and wastewater, which you're going to be getting an update. The community and the board will be getting an update shortly as, a, as an agenda item. Uh, and Board of Health, again, we just covered a significant amount of uh, detail and we'll have more to report at the next meeting. Uh, the only thing that I'd like to comment on again is that, uh, as I indicated earlier, um, you know, my wife and I had, um, had voted this this weekend and I would encourage people who, uh, again, don't want to necessarily wait until election day uh, to take advantage of either the mail-in voting or the early voting procedures. The early voting hours are, have been posted on the website and are, pretty readily available for anybody who wants to, including the weekends, to go down and participate. And, you know, for, if, if, if most people are like my wife and I, um, you know, it, it's been a, a very trying and frustrating and um, tense period of time up, up to this election. So it was actually a great relief uh, to be able to go in, cast our ballot and have it done. And, um, I just wish that for uh, everybody else and encourage everybody to go and participate uh, because you know it's uh, this is our opportunity to to have our say and determine you know what the future of this uh, town commonwealth and country is going to look like you know for the next four years so i would encourage everybody to go down there and, and participate and i think you'll find a, a great sense of relief in finally completing the task so other than that madam chair i'm all set thank you mm. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Walner? Muted. You're muted. 
Uh, thank you. Um, I've been focused on the age friendly initiative in town. And so um, if you are age 55 or older, you are one of the 5,000 in our town who are being asked how we can make North Reading a more age friendly community. This survey was sent directly to your home and only takes 15 minutes to complete. We've already received 500 so far. Thank you. Our goal is to receive at least 1,000 more. So for everyone else, please fill out yours today before the deadline of Friday, October 30th. We are also seeking the voices of adults who will become, or may already be, empty nesters who are asking the emerging question, is there life after kids in North Reading? These adults have developed a strong community connection through the schools, but may be wondering if North Reading can be a place where they can maintain these important social connections while still leading a life of purpose. If this is of interest to you, or anyone who aspires to live in North Reading for life, you are a rising senior. We want to hear your voice, voice regardless of your age. So please fill out the survey, and if you don't have a physical one because you're under 55, you can, uh, it's a survey monkey uh, connection, and you can find that uh, link on um, the town website, under the CIT, I believe it's where it's located. Um, or if you're also interested in participating in a one-off rising senior focus session, you can just write me directly at rwalner at northreadingmass.gov so I can get you involved. And the main message is the best way to predict your future is to create it. This is your time to let us know how to do that. So please get involved. Please fill out the surveys and uh, help us make a better community for all. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Walner. Mrs. Gonzalez? Um, just um, we'll be hearing from Mr. Greenberg um, on the recycling committee um, for uh, a second reading of a policy that we are trying to take steps to get towards um, some grant funding. So um, looking forward to um, hearing that little, in a little bit. Okay. Thanks, Mrs. Gonzalez. Mr. Strudo. Um, I have uh, very little. Um, just like Mr. O'Leary, I've been, I've been doing my best to catch up on the waste and water and we're gonna get an update. Although I've been leaving it to him because it is, it's a lot more complicated than, uh, you know, the title, you think water would be simple and it's probably one of the most complicated things I've ever been part of. So yeah, I have uh, nothing for this week. All right, we're gonna hear, I, I do see our team also joining us. So we're gonna get a little bit of an update shortly. So I'm gonna move into our next order of business, which was a 7.30, <laughs> meeting, vote to sell town-owned land map, 78 parcel, 1723 Riverside Drive, which we originally had scheduled and then continued, but we accidentally continued it to the wrong date. So then we had to republish to have the hearing this evening. Is that about right, Mr. Gilberto? <laughs> All right. And I think we're joined by the petitioners. Are the petitioners with us here? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I saw you there, yes. Oops. Madam Chair, you're correct. We are joined both um, by um, the original petitioners, um, Mr. and Mrs. Carrero, um, as well as um, I see Kathy and Jerry there as well. Um, thank you for uh, joining us. And I know you were on way back at 6.30, so thank you for staying on there. They uh, also abut the, uh, the property um, over on Riverside Drive um, as well. Okay. And so we had a public hearing with regard to this. And I believe that we did the, anybody that wanted to speak on the petition portion, right? We've already done that. Do we, do you, do we need to do that again? Um, Madam, mean, Chair, uh, Madam Chair, we, there, there was an initial discussion that happened prior to the A&R plan being um, completed by um, Mr. and Mrs. Carrero um, and their surveyor. Um, when we opened the hearing, I do not believe we had any public comment at the last meeting. So you, I don't know whether you want to hear from the petitioners um, or from sure. the other neighbors. Well, just for the for purposes of the meeting, if the petitioners don't mind, you know, explaining it again. And and there was a notice published too, correct, Ms. Gilberto? Do That's we, correct. Even though this is continued, should we be reading that into the record again anyway? 
Um, it, we, we probably should, but I don't have it here in front of me and have not put it in the packet. But it, right. for the record, it was published in the, the newspaper of record um, last Thursday. Um, and there was also a very public vote to correct the continuance date prior to the date of the continuance, I think now four weeks ago. Um, and uh, I believe that the parties that are most likely to be interested are all well aware of the timeline and how we got to where we're at. Right. I believe we also looked at the, you had shown us the parcel map, the assessor's parcel map. Um, I don't know if you want to call that up, but if, the, if it, you know, this, why don't we, I know you've explained this to us bef before, but if the petitioner wouldn't mind just a few brief, you know, a brief uh, comment on what you're doing with it, what you'd like to do with it. It's clearly adjacent to your parcel. Um, and go ahead, you can take it away. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, Good evening. So a couple of years ago, we uh, petitioned to acquire a uh, parcel of land next to us uh, from the town. Um, we went to a few meetings, a few hearings, and uh, it was recommended that uh, we subdivide the lot so that the town could keep um, half for easement to the to the river. So we went ahead and, and got it a uh, plot plan with kind of splits the lot in half. Uh, excuse me. <clears throat> we're interested in, of course, uh, expanding our driveway right now. We're right on the lot line. Uh, we also, you know, in the future, hope to, you know, maybe, you know, increase our setback for a garage. Our house is only 36 feet long. And, uh, you know, if we ever had to move our septic tank, you know, we plan on being here for the rest of our lives. So this is, you know, not tomorrow. This is, you know, over the next 40 years or so. So we were hoping to acquire, you know, at least 30 feet or half of that um, lot to do what we want to do. You know in the future so um you know it's been a couple of year process and here we are and uh we'll see thank you and and they the um petitioners have done everything that we've asked them to do to get it to this point uh mr any questions mr o'leary no i'm in i'm in support of this again uh, the, the applicants uh, made a clear case as to uh, their need you know quite a while ago uh, the indication from the board at the time was, you know, favorable. We asked them to go to the planning commission, get to, get it subdivided. Uh, they've done all that we requested them to do, and uh, I think we should uh, grant them the relief and offer it for sale to them. Thanks, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Walner, uh, any uh, questions, comments? All right, uh, Mrs. Gonzalez, questions or comments? No, Mr. Um, I'll set. Mr. Studo? Uh, no, everything was good. Are there, is there anyone um, attending or joining the meeting that would like to speak in favor or against, I guess, this petition? If you would use the raise hand function. Oh, Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, uh, so I, I would just for the board's edification, you know, we were aware of some questions from the abutting property owners, um, Susan and Jerry, uh, Susan and Carrie, uh, excuse me, <laughs> Kathy and Jerry, who are both on the call this evening. And I have to apologize, Kathy, I, I just, I, I never caught your last name. So I, I keep not saying it because I don't know it. <laughs> um, but we went out to the site on Friday and then we went out again on uh, Monday uh, this morning as well and met with the Carreros and with uh, Kathy and, and Jerry to look at, at what we were looking to do and to try to sort of mark out on the ground, not to survey grade, but to, you know, a general understanding of what we were looking to do. And I, I think that we identified um, you know, ac fairly accurately where the midpoint of the town lot would be and what spot would be left to be town owned. Um, and um, we, there was a question, I think, previously about the location of the Carreros driveway. Um, today's visit was able to confirm it does not trespass on town owned land at this point in time. I know that was a concern that we had. Um, and so I, I think the outcome was from the conversation and, and certainly Kathy and Jerry can speak to it themselves, but I think the outcome was that the uh, board was being asked to sell lot 17b um, and I'll share my screen it's the lot that would um, that abuts the uh, the Carreros does everyone see a plan on there yeah um, and I believe that the consensus amongst all the neighbors um, who were involved in the discussion was to that the town would retain lot 17a And I don't know. I don't know if Kathy or Jerry want to add anything or. Well, to answer your question, my last name is Austin as well. Okay, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. 
Go ahead, Jerry. Okay, so so the the lot which was formerly ours was subdivided. Seventeen A contains three thousand five hundred and sixty square feet, more or less. Seventeen B contains three thousand seven hundred and forty square feet, more or less, which is adjacent to the Carreros parcel, which is the portion of our land that the Carreros would like to acquire. So the portion that we would, the town would be retaining. We own it. it it's not a question. It would be that 17A portion, which we, we're retaining to maintain access to the river. And when we did look at this some time ago, there are other access points that we do have also adjacent to other lots. Um, but this was sufficient according to what we heard previously for us to be able to access the lot. Though I think what we heard previously was that topography didn't really, wasn't gonna be the easiest means of access this, this particular area. So does that answer your questions, Mrs. Austin, Mr. And Mrs. Austin, or do you have any other questions? Uh, I would just like to add to these. Um, I believe there's a lot of, of uh, inaccuracies in terms of who owns what, and we have not been provided enough information from the, from the committee here to permit us uh, to uh, examine this ourselves and make sure that it is in fact consistent with all of uh, people involved in this. So other than that, uh, be no comments from uh, our group uh, for the time being. And uh, you'll be notified later of our continued thought and greater depth. Any questions? So this is a, a, a plan that's been prepared. I, we can't really see this, Mr. Gilbert, Gilbert but this is a, a plan that's been prepared by a certified engineer, right? That's the seal at the bottom? Correct. Okay. And uh, so... And it's also been reviewed by the Planning Commission and signed off by them, correct? Also correct. It's actually been recorded at the Larry Street Deans as well. The uh, same thing was true with the site plan for the uh, newer plan, which has been, uh, I guess, a couple of weeks ago. For 19, not for, for this. That's correct. I, I, Madam Chair, through you, I, I know that there was some question about some markings in the ground in the street that we were trying to um, determine whether any of them were surveyors. And it turned out that it didn't appear that, that they were. Um, so we've explained to the property owners in the vicinity that um, you know, we're not, we weren't making any representations about where the survey grade line would be, nor were we able to make any representations about what use the land might have because there are a number of environmental considerations going on with these parcels because of the riverfront buffer. But uh, I, I do think that we, you know, everyone is aware that, you know, that, that, that those are issues that would need to be dealt with separately through the appropriate permitting, um, you know, for, uh, for any development that might look to take place on the parcels. Well, that's all I've got for now. Okay. I'm sure there will be some more later on. Okay. So just for the record then, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Austin, you are not, are you not in favor of the town voting to permit the careers to acquire a portion of the town's parcel? Are you saying you don't want, you're against the town splitting the parcel for sale? This is why we have to have time to review your inputs and look at this again and understand it and we have not had that in a total investment today of about two hours and it's just not enough okay um, 
Mr. Gilberto, uh, was there a public hearing on the uh, Planning Commission's uh, part in relation to the splitting up of it and notification to abutters? Going from memory, this was an A&R plan. Um, I, I don't believe that a hearing is required, but I do believe they submit a courtesy notice to abutters when they are doing that. Um, and I believe that occurred um, sometime in April of this year. So it would have been virtually, but yes. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Gaberta, when did you walk the area? Uh, so we walked the property on um, Friday morning and um, it indicated that we were gonna take some rough understanding of some of the landmarks through our GIS coordinator, try to get a better understanding of where we thought the lot lines were on the ground with the understanding that we were not bringing a surveyor in to do that because that's not something that the town was looking to get into representing one way or the other. And then we returned to the property this morning um, just to uh, try to lay out where we believed um, the, the lines were and the GIS coordinator felt that you know, had an understanding of between three to five foot tolerance of where where the lot lines are and where the, the midpoint, so to speak, that 30 foot frontage midpoint um, was as well. And we, we wanted really just to show everybody what was being considered to the best that we could. We don't normally do that for um, any of these town and land type hearings. I mean, we may go out there and look at what's going on, but where this was a bit of a unique one and we were trying to um, accommodate the needs of the entire, uh, of all the interested parties, um, we did that this morning just to confirm. I figured though it was a little on the safe side. I've lived in uh, Riverside Drive for over 20 years in this town and I have many times over and over watched this process. It's an extremely difficult one because there's not a lot of really hard materials or that, that could lead you. And in fact, it's been basically improperly um i would in the way in which it's been done now for as i say uh 20 20 years so we have uh, a lot of experiments i myself am an engineer i'm not a soil engineer or anything like that um but just be aware there are some serious difficulties to deal with in trying to manipulate this. And that's kind of where uh, this left us. I didn't, we didn't think that there was anything that needed to be done at this point. Certainly we would, if we thought there was unwork done, we would have fixed it up and made it fixed. So I think that's, uh, all I'd better say. Okay, thank you. One of the things we, we're gonna have to do is seek uh, guidance and so on from other persons involved to, uh, to haul them out of the closet, I guess. Because <laughs> they thought they were put away for a while. Okay, anything else? Any other questions, please? If I uh, if I may again, we, we okay. just need to... um, thank you, thank you, Miss Mr. Mr. Miss Mr. Mr. Mrs. Austin. Is there anyone else that would like to speak in favor or against this petition? If you could use the um, raise hand function in the chat, or I see none, Mr. Gilberto. I don't see anybody. I do not see any raised hands. All right. Okay, and to the careers, did you want to add anything with regard to your petition? Uh, yes, please, Madam Chair. Um, so we moved here about four years ago. Um, I, my, my neighbors are wonderful. We, we, you know, we talk to them a lot. Uh, they do own, you know, approximately 400 feet of, of frontage, uh, approximately three lots. And uh, we were afraid to have this land next to us purchased and um and developed like the rest of um the street so you know two years ago this we started this process and you know they've had plenty of opportunity um you know for the past two years so we just feel that we've reached that point and hopefully um you know this is this is the outcome 
Yeah, you know, we've sent them letters and, you know. Um, well, as I mentioned before, you are watching firsthand up close the 20 years. I don't know, are you, are you 20 years old? <laughs> anyway, um, so there's a lot more um, history, if you will. And it just is a lot. Well, I'll have to go over it all again. This, this already represents some uh, uh, past data points on some site designs and so on, of which a lot of people have metal, or not metal, but uh, mounted that sort of stuff already. And it's all recorded in various. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Anyway, we'll continue it at another date. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you to the parties. Um, I'm going to also, um, do we have a, do we have a motion, Mr. Studo? Oh, yes. I'm Mr. One second, Mr. Gilberto. Did no, you? I, it, it's relative to the motion. We do have a motion, and it is okay. on page eight of the packet. I would just clarify that the motion, when it's read, it's going. It, it's written to say map seventy-eight, parcel seventeen, Mr. Studo. And if you have, once you have that in front of me, let me know. Yep, I got it. So that's the third line of the text of the motion. Sorry, second line. It should read map seventy-eight, parcel seventeen B. Okay. Map 78, 17B. Okay. And then if I see it correctly, it's uh, one, two, and four. Correct, Mr. Gilberto? Um, yes, you are correct, Mr. Sudo. Okay. <clears throat> Would you like the motion? Sure. Wait, wait till we have closed the comment portion of the hearing. So it was someone else to provide comment. Okay, so do I have a motion, Mr. Studo? Yes, Madam Chair, I move to sell by auction town-owned land designated as Map 78, Parcel 17B, located at 23 Riverside Drive, in accordance with M Master's General Law, Chapter 60, Section 77B, at a minimum bid price of 1550, subject to the following restrictions. Parcel shall not be used in and of itself as a separate building lot in the provisions of MGL chapter 40A section C pursuant to its ninth paragraph if applicable are waived to prohibit the use of this parcel as a separate building lot. Accessory structures of any kind shall not be erected or maintained on the parcel unless the parcel is combined with an adjoining parcel containing a primary structure. The parcel shall not be used to satisfy minimum zoning of health code for requirements for the construction or use of any additional dwelling unit on the parcel or in an adjoining parcel. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion of our members? And just from the chair, the, the engineer, the certified engineer takes all the data from the meets and bounds from the deeds, all of the deeds of the parcels are deed, the abutters deed, the petitioner's deed. So it's it's fairly precise. Even if the engineer walks it and marks it, those can change, of course. Whoever you know might move them, those can change. But the recording of it on a plan is is a pretty precise process that occurs. So um, and and also I think that in terms of what we typically do vote on these motions with these conditions, it's pretty clear. Um, that whoever does acquire this through auction is not going to be allowed to to build on it, including if this if these petitioners are the successful bidder at auction, even if they combined it with their lot as the adjacent lot owner, they're not allowed to build a, a whole other parcel or piece of property, uh, you know, building upon it. So it's only sort of an accessory use to their parcel for what they, they represented if they do acquire it. If they are the winning bidder, it's for a driveway and for maintaining it adjacent to their lot, uh, current lot. Um, so that's seeing no further discussion. Mr. O'Leary, 
Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Estudo. Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. So Mr. Gilberto, when does the parcel get put up for auction? Madam Chair, through you, this parcel and a parcel that was previously approved for auction prior to the disruption of the COVID-19 pandemic will both go to auction, um, we believe it's sometime in the next four weeks or so. So it'll, it'll be upcoming and there will be, it will be a public auction obviously. And as you know, it goes to the highest bidder, um, but uh, they will go, those two auctions will run concurrently. Um, the uh, other parcel being over off of uh, Burroughs Road. So is the auction going to be like this on a virtual auction or is it going to be in person? Uh, it's likely to be virtual at this point, only because of the way things seem to be going with the restrictions, but we're going to talk that through with uh, tax title um, council as well to determine the best uh, avenue and we will make sure everyone is appropriately notified. And where is this going to be? Where are people going to be notified about the auction? It'll be no notified um, in the uh, in the newspaper here, the North Reading transcript. We'll also put the information on the town's website um, to make folks aware. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you for joining us for this. Our next order of business is a water and wastewater update. And we have multiple individuals here to, to Mr. Clark. I saw Mr. Deming there. Um, so if we, <laughs> Mr. Gilberto, can we jump right to our, to our right, team? Right, right to Mr. Deming, please. All right. Yes, Mr. Deming. I did see him. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, so I'd just like to get started with the uh, an update on the wastewater. Um, we had a meeting last week. Um, there was a representative from Wright Pierce, along with Mark Clark, John Clipfell, and myself. Uh, we met with the North Andover DPW director and the DPW operations manager. Uh, so the purpose of this meeting was to discuss potentially bringing sewer main down uh, 125 uh, down 114 to connect to the Greater Lawrence Sewer District. Um, the first topic that we discussed was um, sending a forced main directly from North Reading to Lawrence. Uh, one of the things that North Andover did bring up um, was that the utilities are pretty crowded on 114, um, so there would have to be obviously significant review before before that could move move anywhere. So. Uh, Wright Pierce was is going to be getting in touch with North Andover and getting their uh, basically their files so they can see exactly what's in the ground. Um, another topic that we discussed if a forest main wasn't a, a possibility is tying into their collection system, which uh, off the top of their heads they weren't sure if they could handle our capacity. Um, I think at the very least without knowing the specifics of their infrastructure we would, um, they would, there would definitely be some upgrades to their pump system and probably some pipes in the ground. So uh, like I said, North Andover is sending the files uh, to Wright Pierce to start the review on that. Um, Wright Pierce is also in the process of reaching out to Mass DOT as 125 and 114 are both state roads. So we would obviously need their approval. Um, and there was another thing that North Andover brought up that was interesting was um, 114, I believe in the area from Merrimack College up to the supermarket um, is in the process of getting approval to be reconstructed, uh, similar to what's going on uh, on Route 28 in Reading. Uh, they're currently at 25% design for reconstruction. Uh, their plan right now is to put that project out to bid in late 2023. Um, so I think we all pretty much agreed that uh, it would be a long shot for us to, to get everything in line and uh, get everything approved and be able to start breaking ground before that. Um, so realistically, you know, if we're five to 10 years out, we're going to be after the point of them reconstructing their road. Um, that right now is, is pretty much all we have on wastewater. Like I said, Wright Pierce is doing some work speaking with, um, with North Andover's engineers and with Mass DOT. Okay, thank you. Mr. Gilberto. If I could just ask Mr. Deming for the background for those who are not familiar, um, we were directed towards 125 and 114 in our discussions with Andover 
Um, could you just give us a little bit of that or could someone give us a little bit of that background? Because I know some of us have been involved in discussions, but not everybody has. Sure. Yeah, I wasn't sure uh, how, when the last presentation was made, but the original, I believe the original plan before I had gotten involved with it was to go right up through 28, um, through Andover um, and to tie into Lawrence. I believe, like I said, it was before my time, but I believe Andover expressed um, they were not interested in us going through downtown Andover. So there's been a few different options that we've started to discuss. One of them was going up 28. Another one was to go up 125, touch a small piece of 114, and then loop back down into Andover and then tie into their system. And then the third uh, aspect that was discussed was just going, like you said, originally up uh, 125 into 114 directly into Lawrence. So there's been three different options that have been discussed right now. Um, you know, I think all of them show, show uh, you know, there's going to be some, some complications in all of them. But, um, you know, our, our intention last week of meeting with Noah Panda was just to get the discussion going. I believe there's an update with regard to water as well and some some progress. There is. Yep. Yeah, I'll, I can uh, touch on and if anybody has any questions, I know Mark's here. He's he's had a lot to do with it as well. I uh, just, does anyone have any questions on the wastewater update? Just a little further clarification. I think I mentioned it a couple of meetings ago is that, you know, Andover, when we first discussed this with Andover, through the negotiations with the uh, 99 year uh, deal on the water, um, everybody's intention was to go up Route 28. But if you recall, you know, last year they had the Columbia gas situation. And as a result of uh, the needs to uh, upgrade all of the uh, gas pipelines, you know, through the town of Andover, the Shawsheen section, uh, a significant amount of uh, digging up and redoing of Route 28 in the downtown area of Andover and the Shawsheen section has already taken place and their appetite for um, digging up their downtown and their Shawsheen area again is diminished. And that's why they asked us to take a look at the alternative, uh, alternative routes. So originally, we we're talking about going up 28. That was the original discussion with Andover. Uh, they weren't too objectionable to taking a look at it and seeing, looking at it and seeing what uh, upgrades and infrastructure they would need in their community to accommodate us at the time. But since then, because of the uh, Columbia gas situation where everything's been dug up and now been redone, their appetite to do it in short order in a short period of time is not, uh, not there, so. Hopefully we're pushing back on that because why would we go up 114 here or 125 there when we have a straight and direct pathway that we're doing. Well, actually, I consult we route it for Columbia it. Gas for because they say they don't want that anymore because we already dug it up for that. But that makes zero logical sense. Although, zero. Although it I consult our project back now now we're here in another five or ten years because they're doing other work on the, those those uh, connections and areas so hopefully our team is pushing back on that actually yeah uh, our consultants ridiculous are, suggestion for us to go to 114 or 125 to get sewer up 28. no actually our, astronomically our more money than what this is potentially going to cost us does anyone else have any questions? Uh, Madam Chair, just in relation to that, our consultants have actually informed us that the 125-114 route may actually be more advantageous, that more advantageous and less costly. Right, so to run sewer up 28? Uh, up 120, yes, yeah. So I'd like to see that, that's news to me. Do we get any memo or information on that from our, from our expert? We've had considerable discussions, and when they took a look at it, it it's uh, extremely viable. It's, it's uh, they're kind of veering off into a completely different direction, literally, because, because we literally directed, for this project. Because we were directed that way, and when they took a look at it, they said, "Okay, you have no yeah, other." Yeah, we've been directed that way by 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 our neighbor, and yeah. does our expert, you know. Our expert has to kind of redirect it to a track that's helpful to us. You have to keep in mind there's no other infrastructure in 125 right now for sewerage. So this would be all new infrastructure. No other uh, 
upgrades to the town of Andover, whether it be the pumping stations or the upgrades to their piping and the capacity to treat the sewerage and pump it through um, an upgrade. And it's just a, it's a straight shot. Really, uh, that's that I'd love to see the memo that our expert prepared for us on that veering it off into this direction but I'm not the only member on the board does anyone else have any questions about this update this Mrs. Gonzalez I, I was just in in my mind thinking the same thing that you just said out loud that it seemed kind of crazy going all that way around um, and I can't understand how that wouldn't be more costly, but yeah, Chris. Madam Chair, uh, just to add to it too, um, if we were to go up 28 through Andover, we would, not only would we, we have to make a, a sewage pump building, um, regardless of what direction we go. If we go through Andover, we would tie into the Shawsheen Valley pump station in Andover. We would also have to pay and over to make upgrades to that building and that infrastructure. Uh, we would also then be required to, to, to pay them um, probably monthly or yearly to use their facility. Where if we were to go uh, 114 and 125, I believe it's a seven mile stretch and our engineers have said that we could do one pump station at the Andover line and make that direct pump yeah, all the way to me and then so there so there is there is added if we were to go 114 and 125 we wouldn't have to get involved with Andover's pump station at all no oh, and I, I think it's important for us to be having these updates at these meetings so we can see the direction that this is taking but prior to these updates i think it's important for us to see those kind of um, modifications or you know expert reviews so that we can have the benefit of reviewing them as well so if you could upload that stuff to our you know folder mr. Gilberto that would be great um, and I I didn't want to interrupt you mr. Deming because I know you're gonna actually does anyone else have any mr. Waller any questions um, I just you know it's obviously getting complicated but i'm not surprised it's a big project so um yeah i don't have any questions at this point okay um i know you do you're going to do water too mr deming but mr just so just on the ways to add it mr strudo any questions good all right so mr deming can you um did you want to absolutely go, go ahead so, on the water so we you know threading's received the interbasin transfer agreement uh, we're now at 100% complete with all of our permits for the water project. Um, as far as the other two projects that we have going on, the water main um, on Mount Vernon and North Street, um, both of them we've received all the bids back. Um, Wright Pierce is right now reviewing um, the bids and they plan to recommend within the week. Uh, that project, for those of you that don't know, is, is planned to start in spring of 2021. Um, and that would be Mount Vernon and North Street from the Moose Tower to Lowell Road. Um, the projected cost for that project was 2.5 million. The lowest bid came in at 1.7 million. It's about $800,000 under. There were 14 total bidders uh, ranging from the 1.7 million to 2.4 was the highest. So like I said, um, our engineers are reviewing that right now to make their recommendation hopefully this week. And for the chemical buildings, uh, as you may recall, we have put out that out to bid. Um, the numbers that came back from the one contractor that bid on it were extremely high. So we decided to put that back out to bid. Um, the filed sub bid uh, due date is this Wednesday, the 21st. And the general contracts are Wednesday, the 4th of November. Um, both of those dates were scheduled for the week before. We got some feedback um, from a few of the companies that planned to bid on it, that there was a large project going on in another part of the state. They had asked if we had pushed both of those dates back by a week to allow for some flexibility for those contractors to bid, which we have done. So both of those were originally scheduled for the week before those dates, but they were pushed back a week. Um, and last Wednesday, we had a pre-bid meeting for potential bid bidders of that project for any questions or comments that they had. Um, and the project deadlines for that, for those two chemical buildings are uh, 
April 15th of 22 for Main Street and August 31st of 22 for the Central Street Chemical Building. Did you have any attendees at your pre-bid meeting? I believe there was one company. I was not there, Mark was. I believe there was, oh, okay. I believe there was one. Okay, any members have any questions or comment with regard to the water update? Are we on schedule? Are we on track? So we, we, we are delayed a little bit from where we originally thought because we, we did put it back out to bid. Um, but you know we've, we've been meeting on this for a while since I've been involved and I think our plans to rebid it are, are right on track now. Um, so like I said, in the grand scheme of the entire project, we are delayed, but you know we, we did it for the right reasons. The, the one company that bid on it the first time was over significant amount uh, that we thought the job was worth. And that's why we put it back on the bid. Madam, yes. what is the projected date? Uh, what is the estimated, you know, time? Um, Mike, do you remember the exact? Sure. So I believe the timeline is for the Main Street station to be completed by the end of the construction season next year. April of 22. I'm sorry. That's so it's actually April, 22, April 2022 with the, August of 22 for Central Street. Central but we're anticipating that both will be completed about the same time. And again, we're looking at the April date because uh, that brings us just to uh, the timeline where the peak demand starts to pick up, you know, with the watering your lawns and filling your pools and all the rest. So uh, we're looking to have that completed and up and running the chlorination plant before that uh, that time period. So, you know, in relation to, you know, have we, has the timeline slipped? Yeah, we were looking to have most of this completed, you know, next fall, but from a logistical standpoint and functional or administrative standpoint, uh, these timelines work and the uh, bid that came in was substantially more than uh, anybody anticipated them to be. It was the only bidder, a lot of other, we were competing with a lot of other contracts and same timeline, and we decided to push it out in order to attract other, uh, yeah. Other, other developers to do it. So it, it seems to be working in our favor at this point. So I'm hearing April of 2022, is that April sound? 2022 for the chlorination plant at the Andover line at North Main Street. Yep. And that's yep. where most of the water comes in from Andover and we need to treat it there. And again, that would coincide with the high demand season yep. uh, picking up at that point. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just uh, something to add to that, that you know the timeline we we were able to utilize a temporary interconnection and temporary water treatment during the high demand season this past summer and the intention and we are uh, authorized to do so for uh, for next summer as well so in you know in terms of you know being at the point where we're drawing all of our water from andover we have been at that point since roughly i think january of this year and we will continue to be in that status what we're talking about here is the expansion of some pipes as well as a new uh, permanent treatment facility and a replacement of a treatment facility. But in terms of the, you know, the, the, you know, being at that spot of being able to draw our water, we have been at that spot since January and for the heavy uh, watering season uh, in May, we were also able to do so because of the temporary interconnection that uh, that's there. Um, the second thing that I just wanted to um, note is that, um, you know, w w this is, Clearly, a lot of information, but um, you know, it, it's a lot of a lot of progress. Particularly the permitting to have that permit in hand now, um, and to have that permanent permit, and to know that we're on a path to get out from underneath an administrative consent order as well. Um, you know, that's a great spot for us to be in, and, it, and it's a testament to work by a lot of people. Um, you know, I think that we'll all be happy when all the pipes are in the ground and when the the pump stations are all up and running, the permanent stations. But we are, are certainly pleased to be going in this direction. I guess the, the final thing too, I'll, I'll just add is that, you know, we've seen some success with rebidding projects. Uh, some of you are familiar with the restroom concession facility at the um, high school turf field and- um, you know, Not we're... relive that one. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, as difficult as it was, probably one of the best decisions we made was to rebid that very late in the game. And um, I think we sort of, you know, took that same strategy here and, um, you know, we're hopeful that it'll pay off in terms of the overall construction costs for the project. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you for uh, hanging in there, giving us the update, and uh, wait, wading through the uh, couple of hearings. So.
or the, the public hearing. All right, so we're gonna move on. We're gonna see you soon with another update, I'm sure. And uh, we're gonna move on to our next order of business, which is the eight o'clock um, hearing on Kitty's restaurant change of beneficial interest. We do have um, petitioner. Yeah, I'm sorry, we do have the petitioner here, right? Yes, I see uh, Mr. Ware and Mrs. Uh, Ms. Berkmeyer as well. All right. I Go ahead. So please introduce yourselves with your state your name and address for the record. Madam I'm Chair, John. do we want to read the hearing notice first? Yes, I'm sorry. Mr. Stuhl, <laughs> do you have a copy of the hearing notice? Just one minute. I'm sorry. I'm hoping that was in the packet. <laughs> Let me see. It may not be in the packet, Madam Chair. Um, let's see if we can find it. Okay. I think separately we received the, um, in the folder, separately we received the packet on this, but I don't recall seeing a notice in that packet either. You, you separated out the files. Yeah, we, we did, and it's, it must have been when we separated it, we did not connect the uh, hearing notice. Uh, if you'd like, I can actually grab the paper copy of it and read it, sure. if you'd like. Sure, please. Madam Chair, I'm going to look at one more spot. Okay. Where did, where was this posted? Where did you post this in the transcript? I, I do have it. It did go in the North Reading transcript. I yeah. have it here. Thank okay. you for the patience. Thanks, Mr. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you. Notice of public hearing in accordance with Chapter 138 of the Massachusetts General Laws, a virtual public hearing will be held by the Select Board on Monday, October 19th, 2020 at 8 o'clock p.m. on the application of Kitty's Restaurant and Lounge Incorporated 123 Main Street for a change in beneficial interest. The hearing may be accessed as follows. There's information relative to the internet and telephone access. 
signed um, the, the previous notice on October 1st, 2020 did not include the passcode necessary to access the meeting. So it was re-advertised to include that passcode and it is signed select board. Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. Okay. <laughs> now we'll, oops, what was that? Back to the petitions you had begun to say, why don't you just give us a couple of sentences about what you're trying to do. We did receive your documentation and essentially you're before us because you're just shifting, you're, you're changing the beneficial owners of the business. Correct. So please state your name, names Deborah and address oh. for the My record. De Deborah Burke, my at 23 Westwood Circle in North Reading. And I'm John Weir, I'm director on the board at 67 Winter Street in North Reading. Okay. Welcome. Anything you want to add on the petition? No, not really. Mr. Gilberto, anything else that the board should be, I mean, we have the packet. It's a, it seems to be a pretty straightforward shift of owner interest. Yeah, that, that's correct. I mean, I, I, and again, the, the petitioners can correct me, but it looks like it's a, a, a rearranging of the uh, ownership percentages amongst the family ownership uh, associated with the restaurant. Um, and um, I know that there was initially an application to um, change the manager to, uh, to Scott White, um, and that was uh, something that ultimately did not need to be processed. And that is because uh, and some of the board members may recall that you approved a, a change of manager, I think going back two years now, um, that was submitted to the ABCC and was approved, but was never returned to us as approved. So we did, we did confirm with the ABCC that their records uh, reflect that Scott is in fact the manager of records. So it is only the change of beneficial interest that's pending tonight. Well, thank you for explaining that petition to us, Mr. Gilberto. I appreciate that. I'm sure the members of the board do too. Do the members have any questions of the petitioners with regard to this transaction? Mr. O'Leary? Uh, no, Madam Chair, I'm well aware. This is just a, uh, a situation of basically estate planning purposes. Uh, uh, the next generation taking over and continuing the uh, uh, business and uh, being good members of the business community makes sense to me and really supportive of their uh, their efforts to uh, to achieve what they need to do here. Thanks for that edification. Mr. Studo, do you have any questions? Are all set? Mrs. Gonzalez? As long as that salad dressing recipe doesn't change, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Walner, any questions? I'm good, thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Um, Gilberto, all the paperwork, the required paperwork uh, is in order on this. Everything that, that we needed to, the petitioner pr to provide has been provided. That is correct, yes. Okay, so um, since it's a public hearing, is there anyone that wishes to speak in favor or in opposition to this petition? I see none. Mr. Gilberto, you don't see any hands raised, right? I don't see any visual hands and I don't see any electronic hands. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Seeing none, we'll close that portion of the hearing. And do I have a motion? Madam Chair, I move to approve a change of beneficial interest for the common vitriol all alcohol license for Kitty's Restaurant and Lounge, 123 Main Street. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Um, Gilberto, I hope you kept that paper notice. I have it. <laughs> Good. All right. Our next order of business is Paradise R2 Incorporated doing business as New England Beverage Transfer of License. And we'll just ask Mr. Gilberto to read the, to read the notice publication into the record. Certainly. Notice of public hearing in accordance with Chapter 138 of the Massachusetts General Laws. A virtual public hearing will be held on the select board, held by the select board on Monday, October 19th, 2020 at 8.15 p.m., on the application of Paradise, Paradise R2 Incorporated doing business as New England Beverage for the transfer of the package store all alcohol license from Sunny Riva 
Incorporated DBA New England Beverage and Redemption, licensed to be exercised at 160 Main Street, North Reading, Massachusetts, in a two-story building occupying 9,980 square feet, selling space on first floor offices and storage on second. Hearing may be accessed as follows via the internet and via telephone uh, using Zoom technology. And it's signed by the select board. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gilbert. Um, we are joined by the uh, current licensee and the petitioner. If you wouldn't mind identifying yourselves uh, with your name and address for the record. Hi guys, my name is Sarah Patel. Everyone calls me Sunny. Uh, address is 5 Ever Street, Taunton, Massachusetts, 02780. I am the current licensee of uh, New England Beverage, uh, doing business as Sunny Ria Incorporated. Thank you. And uh, go ahead, Mr. Lang. Hi, how are you, how are you doing? My name is Kevin Lang. I'm proposed a uh, um, new owner, and my uh, address is 280 Paradise Road in Swampscott, Massachusetts. And you're here to <laughs> such a lot of feedback. There. There's a lot of echo there, yes. <laughs> I think because we're 12 by, so that's probably why. I'm still about 280 Paradise Road, Small Scott, Massachusetts. Oh, yeah. oh, Sorry about that. Is there any way to prevent that feedback? Um, I think if Mr. Lang and Ms. Barney could just both mute and only unmute when they're speaking and maybe the other could turn their volume down. It looks like they may be in the same spot. Okay. Okay. So we're, we're going to hear you on the petition. It's a, we're open in the public hearing. We're going to hear you on the petition. So if you would go ahead and give us some information about your petition. Tell the board about your petition. Okay. Uh, I can start if um, if you guys can hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, so I'm the current owner. I am the recent father of a newborn a baby, uh, August. So things have changed for me in my whole world. And um, Congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, so it's time for me to move on to um, being a father. And uh, apparently the commute and everything else um, was definitely a challenge. So um I, I talked to kevin is an old friend of mine and uh it's time to pass on um my short legacy i should say it's, i've only been in town and being doing business in north Reading has been a wonderful wonderful opportunity uh i've been there only for five years and um sadly to say i have to um yeah kind of sell but it's it's that time unfortunately but okay thank you uh, i I mean, congratulations and thank you. Uh, these are life decisions. So well, let's hear from the petitioners, if you wouldn't mind giving us some information about your experience, your training, um, your, your background, your, your employment background, and some information that you can give the, the board to consider. Yes. Guys, would it be easier to just uh, both of you guys get on one screen? And if you guys, yeah, that's that's what we're doing now. Okay. Hi, how are you doing? Good evening for the board member and everybody. Uh, my name is Kevin Langs. My wife sit next to me here. We are the proposed buyer for the new location that uh, Sunny been run for five years. And the, the location is well known for me. And uh, Sunny been run for five years. And then right now he decided to change his um, way of living down the further south shore. So he called me, see if I can take over. So I agree for, to do that, and right now be really be happy to take over if the board 
allowed to transfer. And I have experience on the liquor business for so long. I have a different location and with partnership with other location, a different town, but North Reading is the first one that I'm coming in. So the experience to run the liquor business is well experienced for me. So I'm asked the board if the board can be approved for a transfer license and I will do my best to run the location as the way it is, as the best in town. Okay, and I, I can see that you're, it looks like you already are at an establishment. Is that another business that you own? Yes, ma'am. Yes, where ma is that located? This one is located in Swampscott. And are you the manager of that business? My wife is a manager. So how many hours do you plan to spend at this uh, proposed location? The uh, proposed location, I'm going to spend at least 60 hours. My wife's going to be there close to 40 or 50 hours also. And how many other establishments do you own? I have one in uh, Somerville, Massachusetts. Okay. And I have one in... Um, South Boston as the uh, partnership, 50% partnership. Okay, and are you the serving as the manager of those as well? Yes, but those are only part-time over there. I have a managers over there, but I'm just in charge of uh, look over the manager. Okay, and have you ever had any issues of of disciplinary action with regard to the other establishments that you own or have interest in? The other location that established right now don't have any discipline, but the previous one that we've been um, sold, I have one about 15 years ago in um, Lynn. Okay, but nothing currently? Not, nothing currently. Do you have... Um, do you have any businesses that you own in other states? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, I um, ask him because Mr. Gilberto, I don't think the application was in our packet. I didn't see it. It's here. It's here. A separate folder. A separate, separate item in the packet tonight. I saw that, but it looks like a tip certificate. No, it's yeah. the application. No, it was the two. But... The application should be uh, behind it. Um, <clears throat> Madam Chair, but I have a question for you. Yes, Mr. Mr. Studo, <laughs> Mr. Oh, Studo's got his hand up. Well, we'll get to you, Mr. Gilberto, but Mr. Studo, go ahead. Um, I have a question about current. Um, if I'm reading this directly, if I'm reading this accurately, so what's today, the 19th? Yesterday, there was a violation there in New England beverage. That oh, I, well, I, I just let me finish and let me ask. So the violation here says that uh it you know a pack of whatever a, pa a 12 pack of bud light was sold to someone underage when questioned mr ling said that i hope i said that correctly that the person looked 21 and they were still in training so my question is well if you give me a resume of all that experience i don't the the two the two the, the statement and what was just said here don't mix um let me answer oh yesterday's situation i was there um sunny was upstairs and then i would try to uh, help him out why he take um i think he take a little break so i did make a mistake there by miscalculate him and the previous one um sunny check on him i see he check on him we have he have an id but at this time i assuming it's the same gentleman there so i make the under misunderstand so the person in question i believe has been to the establishment with an id um whether or not it's been a fake or not that's on me so i take full responsibility for that um but in the last five years i've never had any violation on my license and in the past 10 years i've never had a violation on any of my other businesses as well um so uh, again i'm so, so sorry about that happened and especially on a sunday but uh over the course of last five years in north reading i've confiscated a lot of fake licenses uh whether it be from people out of state maine uh, a lot of kids from andover used to come in and visit our establishment thinking they can get away 
doing certain things, but uh, I actually built a wall of fake IDs um, right behind the counter to deter people from buying underage. And it's been working for a long time. And yesterday, like I said, I, I am so sorry that happened. And uh, I will assure you, uh, it's not going to happen under my reign and Kevin's either. Kevin is like in the last 15 years, he's only had one violation. So that can attest to his um, responsibilities too. And uh, we will, I will promise you this, this, that it, it's, it's not right, but it's not going to happen again. I can assure can, you. Can I, I'm just going to follow up. So you said that maybe the person was there and could have had a fake ID in the past. That's my guess, because based on the surveillance footage, it seemed like I recognized the person. Okay. Well, the reason I ask is, I mean, this is someone who came in with the police department, volunteered. So if that's the case, they used a fake ID, but then volunteered to help the police on a sting. So I don't know. I mean, I'm just that's curious. Weird. Yeah, that, 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 that is definitely weird. But I do, from what it seems, I did kind of like from the surveillance tapes, recognize the fella. But again, okay. sorry, but it's not going to happen again. It's a strict, strict policy. And I'm, I'm assuming that uh, the police department has run multiple things on me in the past. And um, I've never let the ball slide. And uh, I did this time. So again, I'm, I apologize for that. Ms. Sister, do you have any other questions for the petitioner? No, not not from the petition. If the only thing I would say is again, um, you know, thank you for volunteering that information. But if it was the case that it was someone who may have gotten away with it in the past, and then we just assumed he was twenty one, I think, I think oh, it's no. easy. To, yeah, if we check, well, I think it's it'll be easy to answer that question because we can just ask uh, Detective Mara and Detective Lucci of whether or not this person has done this before for them. And if the answer is no, then we just, I mean, we, we know who the person is. That's the question. So we can directly okay. get that answer. So that, that's, that's all I wanted to add. Okay. Like I said, from the surveillance footage, it seemed like the custom, the, the person in question was there. And I, from, from what I understand, I did check his ID before. So, but it's, we have, I've been known in town to confiscate IDs uh, over the past five years. I've, literally ripped up i've had people try to snatch them out of my hands and a lot of other things in the past and um, i don't tolerate that i never have and uh, mr patel we appreciate your explaining this but we're really here to hear from the petitioner oh sorry yeah no and uh, not you that's why i feel like i've been doing that yeah. from what i if you don't mind not talking over people too from what oh. i can understand sorry. i i heard the petitioner say he was the one that did the sale. Am I mistaken when I hear that? Did was it was it you, Mr. Yes. Lang, that yes, sold? Yes, I did. And yes, Mr. I, Patel wasn't even there. Is that? Was, yeah, he was step out, cool. and then I'll jump jump and help him out on that moment. So I'm the one that take um, make a mistake that that sale. I, okay, so are you currently employed there. I'm, no, I'm in the training there. You're in training. I'm, yeah, I'm going there and watch the business and see how it runs and okay. almost every day, yes. Okay. Yeah, he, he wants to check up on, uh, sorry, may I speak? Sorry. So I, I'd like to give an uh, opportunity for the uh, other members to ask any questions of the petitioner. Mr. Walner, have you, um, Mr. Um, I'll just, I'm going to get to you, Ms. Gonzalez. Mr. Walner, any I, I questions? Just, I would just ask for the new one. For the new owners, has anybody done a background check on them to verify, you know, the claims? Has that is that standard practice? I don't know if that's standard practice or not. Mr. Gilberto, our, our practice is that we do a um, a Corey check and a civil fingerprinting check on their background. Um, they also are required to fill out um, an application which you received in the packet. That details what they've done um, in terms of you know extensive follow-up with uh, outside of the community on the businesses that they claim to run we do not generally do that um, although these uh, transactions are all reviewed by the alcoholic beverage control commission so they may conduct that um, but that's the extent of, of, of our review okay right. any other questions mr walner uh so when does the Al when does the abcc do their thing A after the board votes favorably it's forwarded to the abcc um, for their uh their approval as well um, okay thank you 
Um, Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, do you have the equipment in the store that runs the IDs and tells whether they're valid or not? I forget uh, the name of it. There is an ID check system software, but we, I do not have that because I've been using handmade books that I get from the beer distributors every year. And that has a lot of detailed information in terms of the spot fakes and whatnot. And that is what I use to spot a lot of fake IDs myself. Um, but in terms of a software, I do not have uh, um, a verification software. But yeah. Kevin and um, Susan can definitely look into getting one. They're not that um, hard to obtain. Um, <clears throat> if you definitely will. We will do that. Um, may I say something? Of course. Um, so, Mr. Walner, I did have my Corey check done this morning. So that's all situated and it went back to the town already. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The Corey checks are part of this and there's a requirement for Department of Revenue form to be provided to make sure that the parties are up to date with their all of their financial requirements. And um, I think all the Corys, the Corys did come back already, right, Mr. Gilberto? Both yes. Corys came back. I believe so, yes. And both petitioners are, uh, have their TIPS document. I did see that, the TIPS mm -hmm. documentation there. Mrs. Gonzalez, do you have any other questions? No, I just, it's unfortunate that that violation had to happen at this, at any time, but especially mm -hmm. at this time, it makes this decision a little bit more difficult, you know, to consider. But Mr. If, Excuse me, Mr. Lang, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, if I may, may say something, ma'am, um, the situation that happened yesterday is unfortunately it's happened. It shouldn't be happened. And I promise you, if I will run in there, if the board allowed to transfer the license, I will guarantee it's never going to happen. We'll put the equipment in there. We'll make sure the uh, all the employees will be trained, and they all have to be a, a tip class, and they all have to be trained very well to uh, to catch the underage. We we're running the business. We have intention to run the best business in town so we don't have any of those situations. My intention is to be the best neighbor in town if the board allowed to transfer. Do you have any other questions, Mrs. Gonzalez? No, thank you. Um, Mr. O'Leary, any questions? Um, just to the applicants, uh, in your other establishments, do you have any of this uh, software for um, identifying fake identification? The, the other establishment, we don't have it also, so. Okay. And then um, I was looking at, at your application. I don't see anything listed in South Boston. I see the Somerville, Swampscott. Uh, you mentioned someplace in South Boston. I just don't see that on the application. I'm um, as the uh, silent partner, 50% silent partner. Oh, silent partner, okay. Yes. <laughs> There is no such thing as a silent partner in a liquor license. Must be economically. Anyway, I, I do see the certificate of good standing, uh, tax compliance, and I see the same thing for um, Division of Unemployment. So that's all set as far as the application goes for me uh, to transfer it over. Um, I would just like to say that, you know, Sonny's been a good member of the business community for, for five years, and congratulations on the birth of your child. You and Mr. Studo have something in common here, although he's got two up on you, so he's got three up now. <laughs> Losing sleep, but enjoying every minute of it. Yeah, uh, yeah. You can't ask for a better experience. Well, if you want to, you want to know about experience, you just give uh, Vincenzo a call. He'll, he'll fill you in a little bit. Um, <laughs> but again, I appreciate, you know, you being a good member of the business community. Um, I intend on uh, voting for the, the transfer. Um, Again, it's an unfortunate set of circumstances that occurred yesterday, obviously. Um, you know, I would anticipate that you, you would put in uh, the requisite amount of uh, the software to uh, do a little better job in relation to the uh, identifying, because I don't think it's that expensive uh, to do. So I intend on, on supporting the, uh, the application, the petition here. Um, but, and, and welcome you to the community uh, if the rest of the board members go along with this and look forward to having a long and successful career here. But uh, 
again, be mindful that, you know, our local police department does a very good job of, um, as Sonny can verify. They do an excellent job and they're always there for you when you need them, yeah, so, so they're a great asset. But, uh, but again, it's unfortunate what occurred, um, but I still think it's uh, the application and the experience that you bring uh, warrants the support of the application. Th thanks, Mr. O'Leary. I'm gonna, we got a couple of red flags here. So if your application doesn't have your interest, whether you call it silent or not, you're gonna have to submit an updated application with any interest that you have, because the application is pretty comprehensive. And it, if you have a beneficial interest, we just went through a public hearing for just a shift of of what Mr. O'Leary explained was an estate planning matter. Uh, yes. We just went through a, a public hearing on a, a petition where when we got the edification from different people from the town on that petition, we learned a little bit about what that was about. So even that slight change of uh, ownership of beneficial interest is required to come before the board. So whatever you have has to be in that application and there's there should be that information should be included and i wouldn't be in favor of it unless it's amended and that's a contingency of your you know amending your application to include anything that you have a beneficial interest in it's our job to investigate review and see whether you're a, a good candidate whether you're you know, by telling us you have something that's not even on there, that's a big red flag. So, um, Mr. Um, Mr. Patel, was it Mr. O'Leary or Mr. Patel? Mr. Patel, go ahead. Um, so from what I understand is it was, so from that red flag you were speaking of, it's, it was a more of a monetary transaction rather than an actual um, ownership of the license, if I understand it correctly, because um, it was, they've been friends and associates and colleagues for a long time. And it was more or less, they loaned money to the other party, uh, the owner. And then it was, uh, uh, more or less a handshake, um, deal for, between them. So when Kevin mentioned, he has, he, he helps them out and uh, gives them staffing and whatnot from what I understand. But I think Kevin can speak more on that if, um, he needs to elaborate, but. He was pretty clear saying he was a 50% owner. So that should be on an application. Okay. Um, but okay, does, that, does anyone else have any questions? Um, and we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to speaking in favor and again. Mr. Studo, did you have your hand up? Yeah, um, uh, Mr. Ling, what's the name of the place in South Boston where you have just the monetary interest, if I'm understanding that, please? It, the name it's called... Code? It's called Broadway Social Wine, so. Okay. It's a retail, retail establishment? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so if, if, is there anything else um, that any, of the, uh, any members have any questions on? All set to the members? And is there, is there I'm gonna take um, uh, comment and, and um, public comment, but Mr. I, I see your hand, Mr. Greenberg, but just let me, Mr. Mr. Gilberto, if you don't mind, he might have some more information and then we'll get, we'll get to you, okay? Mr. Gilberto. Thank you. I, I was going to ask for an explanation relative to um, the location of South Boston because it is not in Section 6A, his interest in an alcoholic beverage license. So um, that was my first comment. The second was um, just with regard to the you know procedure here, um, for the board members who may not know, the board customarily will take a vote at a meeting to schedule a show cause hearing for a future meeting when it receives a report of a potential uh, violation, as was the case here. Um, and so, you know, in this case, that's the, those are steps that are going to need to take place. At least the initial consideration of a vote was not on the agenda for this evening, um, obviously. So we're, I'm not asking that vote take place this evening, but we certainly should look to do that sooner rather than later so that a hearing can be scheduled sooner rather than later if there is in fact going to be a transfer of the license um, so that it can, you know, any potential discipline can be served by the current licensee. So I, I do want folks to keep that in, in mind. And M Madam Chair, you and I can talk about what the best way to handle that, whether we schedule a, a quick special meeting to schedule that hearing 
um, so that we can address um, that that issue because it does it's normally something that gets scheduled for a hearing and then there's a full presentation as the board members know. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now I'm going to open the I'm uh, going to open the hearing up to anyone that would like to speak in favor or against or have, has comment. And I did see Mr. Greenberg. You're on mute, so if you could unmute yourself. Okay, I, this is a little awkward. I, I'm, I'm sitting here because I'm interested in an agenda item that's down the agenda. And I just am sort of sitting here and watching. Now, coincidentally, I just retired from a 50 year career practicing law. And I represented during the course of my career, many, many license holders. And I am familiar with the requirements of chapter 138. And just in passing, I am deeply, deeply troubled what I have just heard. Because I've heard what I've heard sounds like an admission of a knowing violation of a very important provision of chapter 138. And I've heard Mr. Patel try to deflect and defer that. I'm really troubled by this application. I'm done. Okay. All right. Thank you for your comment. And, and Paul, thanks for sticking around. Uh, We'll, we'll get to your stuff too pretty soon. Whatever. Okay. Is there anybody else that would like to speak on this application in favor or against? Um, I do not see any hands, any other hands. Mr. Gilberto? I don't see any uh, electronic or uh, real hands. Okay. Any other? So seeing none? I'm going to close that portion of the hearing. Uh, is there any other comments? And we can take a motion, deliberate, discuss further. Mr. Studo, do you have a motion? You're on mute. You're on mute. So we will, we're going to vote tonight. I thought it was. Is the application complete? I thought. It wasn't. Yeah, um, I mean, if yeah, if it's not complete and we have to, I don't know. I, I I can read it. I just thought that, I mean, I I'd, I'd like to before I vote, I'd like to, you know, find out if if it was a disclosable event based on how the deal was structured, and you know, and I think Mr. Gilberto just said too for whether you know, I don't know. I'm not saying whether or not it would derail anything, but for what happened yesterday, Mr. Gilbert, did I hear correctly that that needs to be like recorded somehow first before a vote or should? Uh, I, I'm only saying that um, the board customarily votes to schedule a hearing, has the hearing, and then if there is any discipline that's issued, you know, that that discipline would need to be um, affected, whether it's a suspension or some other, some other action. Um, and that you, I think I would presume the board's intention would be that it would be served by the current current ownership. But that that's more an yeah. assumption on my part. So we don't have a, so what, if Mr. Studer, we don't have a, a disciplinary matter on the agenda to discuss this evening, though I'm sure we would all like to discuss that. It did come up in the presentation because we're trying to determine character and reputation and sufficiency of the petitioner as part of our responsibilities here and their ability to hold the, hold the retail license um, and comply with the law. So that did come up just like a Corey check comes up and other things come up for us. Um, so we don't have the discipline before us to, address so we don't we're not we're not gonna we can't hold it as a reason not to grant or deny the license we have to do that independently of that disciplinary matter although okay. we know we know from the information that it was the petitioner that did the sale um so we we do at least have that fact before us right now as we're considering this application so mm -hmm. Can I just ask one more question then, if that's the case? Do you mind? Uh, I'm not trying to drag this on, but, and this question is Mr. Uh, the, for Broadway Social Wines, 
who is the actual registered owner? Who's the primary, who runs it? The name? It's Saeed. Gul Saeed? Yes, sir. Okay, so just, just again, this is just public record. Uh, Mr. Ugg's name's nowhere near the ownership on the Secretary of State's anything. So if it is, if it is monetarily silent, then it, I mean, it's really silent, like old school silent. Just, you know, I just wanted to, that, that's why I asked for the name. I just wanted to look that up for my own thing. So I don't know. So the question is, I'm not a lawyer, Mr. Greenberg. Thank you for that. And Ms. Manipelli, I know you are, but does, because that's the case that he's technically nowhere near registered on the business and his name's not on it, would that be disclosable? Yes, because it's part of the application. So, and even the financing of a transaction, but we don't really know if you want to ask more questions of it, but we don't really have that other application before us and to see what was submitted on that. But okay. any type of a loan that's granted for someone to obtain a license has to be disclosed, even if it's a personal loan, a promissory note, a bank loan, anything like that. Is part, if it's part of the financing of a license transaction because the ABCC follows the money. We're supposed to get a specific amount of documentation demonstrating where the money's coming from for the purchase, but the ABCC goes even further and follows the money trail here. So they're, they have also have an intense financial review of these applications. Okay. So, Thank you for clarifying. Um, so we can, the, um, our option, if you wanted to consider, and I don't know um, if, we, if we're, we're going to vote on this, we can also, we have the option to vote on it and vote on it with these contingencies that could be added, which would include them providing a full disclosure in their application. Um, we have the option of, uh, you know, tabling it or continuing the public hearing to a later date till we have that. I don't know what the board's pleasure is here. So, Mr. O'Leary, you're in favor of us moving it forward. Either I'm, I'm in favor of uh, continuing it until the board members get uh, comfort level, one way or the other. Uh, so, continue it till our next meeting. That's what a couple of weeks. Yeah, November second is what I said. Yeah. And is that um, the weeks. general consensus, Mr. Walner? Yeah, I, I kind of feel good about let's get this cleaned up a little bit, you know, um, and let's give us a little bit more time to get things straightened out. And two weeks doesn't sound like a lot to ask from my point of view. Okay. Ms. Ms. Gonzalez? I agree. I'd like to table it, um, get the application squared away, and have all our information. Okay. And Mr. Studo, I think that's where you are, you're at. Okay. So, Mr. Gilberto, where what we would like to do is continue the public hearing. Yes. So we took a motion to do that. Do we have anything else scheduled for that night for public hearing wise? Um, I do not believe we have anything at this point in time. So we could schedule it for 7.30 or something like that if the board wanted. Madam Chair, I move to continue the public hearing on the application until uh, November 2nd at 8 p.m. Second. I have a motion by Mr. O'Leary and a second by Mr. Studo. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Daniel Pelli is aye. Thank you. Okay, so we'll be back. We'll, we're going to uh, afford you the opportunity to complete the application so that we can do more of our own vetting of the application and get some of these questions answered. And then we will have you back to conclude the public hearing at our next meeting. Okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. All right, our next order of business is the report from Server Training Program Auditor. Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, thank you. And uh, the board's designated auditor, Ms. Lockowitz, is with us here this evening. Amy, how are you? Hey, everybody. 
Good evening. Thank you for hanging in there. Of course. And I know that stuff is important to you. What we were just talking about is pretty important to you. Yes, thank you. Go ahead. Okay, uh, if it's okay, I'd like to share a screen. I um, have a very brief presentation. Sure. Thank you. So I am going to start with um, the TIPS compliance overview. And just before I start, I do want to um, clarify something. Although we often call it TIPS, it is actually um, a responsible server training. TIPS is actually a brand name. So I just wanted to make the board aware of that because as uh, vendors start submitting their applications, you might not see the name TIPS. Um, ServeSafe, for example, does one. And I've actually come across uh, four or five different uh, training options. So. Um, for the purpose of tonight, though, I'll, I'll call it tips because that's kind of what we call it around the industry. Um, so during the first quarter, I was able to complete uh, visits to all of the retail and common victuallers um, license holders. You can see that we had uh, during quarter one, two violations and then six violations. Of course, because that was the first time we had ever done it, there were no repeat violations. Uh, rightfully so, during quarter two, I was sidelined, uh, not allowed to go into those businesses if they were even open. And so I recently completed quarter number three, where you can see that we had a total of six violations. I am happy, oh, excuse me, two of those were repeat violations. You can see it was um, Eastgate and Joe Fish. I will tell you that in all cases, all violations work with me very quickly to update their tips training or get, get me um, a copy of the certificate that may or may not be uh, or, or is not on, on the location. I will note that on during both of those quarters, I was unable to visit Hillview. I visited, I think, a total of eight times, eight to 10 times, never was able to catch them open. Um, and from what I understand from the pro shop, specifically Hillview, they really haven't been operating um, at all. One of the key highlights though, was after the first quarter, through a small grant with uh, Winchester Hospital, I was able to offer all of the retailers as well as the restaurants, anybody who wanted it actually, including Aldersgate, um, who wanted to get compliance trained, a free class. And so we had 68, that's a typo, 60 individuals um, take that class, saving the businesses a total of $2,165. And I was very thrilled to get that kind of turnaround um, participation. Again, it, it's our goal to not have any violations and we could not have made it any easier. We removed the financial um, cost to getting people trained and that worked very well. Um, moving forward, I hope that we'll be able to offer that again, although it will be funded from the Drug Free Communities Grant, not the Winchester Grant as that has expired. I can talk briefly on NRPD compliance. Um, they were able to do observations on three dates. And just to explain what an observation is, we have detectives that go in undercover vehicles to various locations and look for what appear to be underage buyers. And then they run um, their backgrounds and see if, the, uh, if those purchasers are underage. Those had, I'm very, again, happy to say that they had no violations. Those all happened in the first quarter. Um, as you heard, we had two violations yesterday of retail undercover. Um, you uh, just heard about New England Beverage as well as uh, Lucky Mart had, a sec had their violation. And um, we were not able to do that for restaurants though because of the rule regarding eating on premises when ordering alcohol. So uh, we're not able to check that. That is something that has been a change since COVID. Of course, we normally would do that or the NRPD, I should say, would normally do that. It's overseen by detectives, but we weren't able to do that because of the rule related to food. A couple of youth programs I wanted to highlight. Uh, the first is Shoulder Taps, and this involved our North Reading Youth Action Team. It was really well received. And what happens is this is targeted for retail locations, and it's meant to be an education program. So what happens is our youth stand in front of the uh, venues and they ask uh, customers casually if they would buy alcohol for them. And I'm happy to tell you that we had 47 no's and a whole lot of finger wagging a whole lot of uh, customers who gave the kids a really good stern talking to before the detectives could intervene. Um, that's my best case scenario is that everybody said no. And these are the cards that uh, they get hidden, uh, handed out to them. So if somebody says no, 
they get a card that says thank you for protecting our youth. And if somebody were to have agreed to buy them alcohol, they would get a red um, card that says think twice. So no violations actually happen. The kids intervene and stop the activity before, before a purchase would even be made. Um, but again, we had a lot of support from a lot of the vendors as well as public who talked to the kids and told them how wrong it was, um, not knowing that they were basically actors. Um, the second program involving youth is called Sticker Shock. And in this one, these brightly colored stickers go um, and get placed physically on alcohol beverages. We had five volunteer locations, Ryers, Christopher's, Eastgate, One Stop, and Convenience Plus all agreed to participate. This, was, this program was offered to all retail outlets, but only five agreed to participate. And the kids put 850 stickers on different alcoholic beverages. Again, this is paid by the Winchester Grant. Um, I can do want to give a shout out to Ryers who took it a step ahead and asked for permanent shelf talkers. So we have mounted permanent shelf talkers in their alcoholic beverage section of, of the Ryer store. And this is something, um, it went over so well that I'm hoping to offer that to the other retail vendors moving forward. I do have a couple of recommendations related to my experience with the TIPS compliance training. Currently, our, um, the North Reading policy involves a 30-day window where new employees uh, have 30 days to get their TIPS compliance training done, but in that time, they can still serve alcohol. That's um, a bit of a concern for me that has a huge liability for a lot of people involved, but most importantly, they have no training and they're serving potentially undercover, uh, excuse me, underage youth. And that's um, something that I would love to see closed. The second is requiring all the TIPS certification or cards to be kept on site. Nothing in policy nor on the card requires that to happen. Um, preferably, what I would like to have is that the server has their card on their person because they own the card and that a copy be kept on site and available for inspection at any time. Um, an ex example of that where it's become a problem is Teresa's where um, they were saying that all the cards were kept in an offsite in Middleton. And in reality, not one person when I did my visit, it actually had been trained. Or I should say had a current training. Um, they were all expired if they had it at all. Um, and the last one that would really um, help me out is to request a roster at the time of relicensing. So I, I reviewed briefly the relicensing package and I understand that uh, vendors need to tell you how many staff they have and then provide that amount of cards to you but it's nothing to say that those match up. And so that's what we're finding is that really there's a lot of opportunity for um, putting forth a, a card for um, a business that they're not even working in North Reading. So those are three recommendations of policies that I would love to see closed up. Um, I will also mention that I believe North Reading is the only town in the entire area that follows up on this particular program. So I wanna thank the board support and allowing me to do that because I am able to build a lot of relationships with these vendors and say, listen, I don't want to come in and catch you. How can I help train your staff to keep our kids safe? We've had great conversations. Um, sometimes when I go in and visit, we have conversations about how to protect themselves during COVID, specifically when they don't want to ask anybody to lower their mask. You know, that was something that we started seeing a trend around the beginning of summer. We got some, um, some notifications and some leads that a lot of vendors were not, not just in North Reading, but across the state, were not properly IDing people because they don't want to ask to lower their mask. And that's totally understandable. But that's where I go in and I say, you need to rely on your other training from tips on how to identify um, or match up a, an ID to a person. So some great conversations have happened. And I think that is it for my, that report. I'll pause right there. Does anybody have any questions for me? That's great. Thank you for thank you for this information. It's really well put together and also given us recommendations on policies. I wish we had this before the before that public hearing. <laughs> but let's ask let's go to the members. Mr. O'Leary, any questions, comments? No, other than you know, I appreciate the, the efforts that's being put into this. I think it's uh, important. You know, for the public, but also important for the businesses. And I think it's a great service that's being provided here. And it is, it's a service, so good job, Amy, thank you. Thank you, I should have mentioned as well, it does give us an opportunity to also um, introduce resources uh, that Laura Miranda could offer the businesses as well for their employees if they ever have any concerns about substance use or mental health. And that's been another outlet for us to get 
her information out there. Ms. Fistudo, questions, comments? No, it's great. Like, I agree. I mean, it's, uh, I never exactly knew how all the restaurants get uh, tested until, you know, <laughs> you get involved and then you see. It's always like, oh, I wonder, uh, I wonder how that happened. So, no, it's nice to know that, um, you know, and even during these trying times where trying to conduct anything that involves restaurants is, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, you know, it's almost like you're told to just don't go unless you absolutely have to. And this is something that it's like, well, it has to get done. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Gonzalez. I just uh, want to also thank you, Amy, for a great job. Um, and what came to my mind when you were asking about um, them having to have the cards available um, as a licensed cosmetologist, if this state comes in, I have to have my license on me, um, not just in the salon, but on my person. So that makes sense to me. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Walner. Just, uh, just a question. This is great, great stuff. So thank you, Amy. Uh, just a question. You know, as we learned here in the last, uh, the Patels and you know that transfer. You know, they didn't have the equipment that I think you're recommending. Are you still going to all these places to give them best practices about how they can protect themselves and do a better job? Is that still an active campaign? I know we talked about that maybe six months ago or something like that. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't recommend any particular brand of software or machine because to be honest with you, if somebody has the money, they're going to be able to beat the machine. Um, I know certain places in town have very expensive ones and they've been beat. Um, so I don't want to get, I would, I would hate to put on a vendor and recommend a $2,000 machine that doesn't work, you know? Yeah. Um, so we actually say that your best protection is your training, is your tips training. Don't rely on the machine. We say this to them all the time. If something doesn't feel right, if you're just unsure, there's no reason you don't, you can't check somebody who's 50 years old or appears under 40. Um, so that's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. I don't typically recommend the machines unless we talk about it. And even then I don't recommend a brand because of the financial investment. Um, and also because to be honest with you, um, you know, ultimately it's still their responsibility. You know, they can't rely on that machine. And yeah. Training. I've done, by the way, I should mention that there's an online training and an in-person training to, to experience it myself. I've done both of them. I do recommend one of my best practices is to do the in-person training. I find it to be far superior. Um, you get to talk to a trainer and play out real life scenarios. And he talks to you about how to deescalate situations that might get a little bit heated. Like, you know, how dare you ask me for my ID or even um, in restaurants, how to approach a customer who might be overserved. I find the, um, that that's my most current uh, best practices is to recommend the in-person. Now with COVID, that's all changed. Uh, we do what we can with the online training, but um, thank you for asking. yes, we offer them recommendations. Okay. And, as well as trends. So a couple of months ago, maybe about six or eight months ago, we were seeing a lot of fake IDs from Maine and I notified all of those vendors. Yeah. You should kind of set off a red flag for everybody right now. Yeah. Okay, so training is the bottom line basically is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Amy, can you flip to the next um, page of your presentation where you show the violations? Uh, for the second page, I think it was the oh, second. backwards? Oh, right here. So when you say server compliance and violations, what is specifically the violation? Either the server that was on duty at the time did not have any training or their training card was expired. They're good for three years. Um, one of the ways that I think that we go above and beyond is I actually notify based on the documents they, they give to you during, um, during relicensing, um, I give them a heads up when it has, is about to expire. So the thing is that you have some repeat that didn't, they, they still didn't have people that were trained. And I'm fairly certain we have a policy, a board policy, to, I could, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, where we, we require them as part of our vote to approve, we require them to have their employees tips trained. So if they're not following the policy, then 
we should probably be calling them in to, you know, I, I, I mean, even as a warning, call them. It's certainly in. moving forward. Right, right. Um, especially because you did this by visiting them. So you already were alerting them, you know, you're not in compliance and you have to comply. Mm -hmm. Then they had a good period of time between quarter one and quarter three, but you still have three establishments that are back on here. So they were not the same employees though. Well, that's still the yeah, same me, issue. Though, right? I agree, but I just want to clarify that they were different employees. Yeah, yeah. So, but any employee that's serving has to, or selling, serving or selling is required to be tips trained. Perfect. So, or, um, you know, com serve a compliance train. Mm -hmm. So, is there um, another training that you'd be offering anytime soon? Or did you run out of money for that? Um, I ran out of the Winchester Hospital grant. I, um, I think I would like to offer this again. Um, I know you have licensing coming up. Um, now might be a good time to do that, actually. Let me have a look at the budget. It, again, we had 68 people take it on, so it cost just over two grand. Um, I think that's something, a cost that I can absorb right now. Well, if, if it's by grant, though, but the, it's a business expense, so the business should it be is. paying for it, not you for them, right? It I is, but we're trying to remove any. Any you found way. some funding for it. I think that that's wonderful that you did that for them and that they took advantage of that. But it's something that they're required to do anyway. That was kind of a gift that you were able to do that, secure funds to do that for, for at least those 68 individuals. So um, maybe in terms of if the, if the, I know we are not voting on anything, but the, maybe what we can do, because we're now in the renewal process time frame and now is the time to kind of basically hammer home the issue here um, maybe we can include something in the um, you know annual renewal process you know maybe we can think about this for our next meeting which is is that in will no and it won't be before renewal process but renewal applications are due by the end of November so maybe we can basically make sure that these establishments are in compliance or at least know what our policies are and then add those policy recommendations under consideration. We should maybe take that under consideration at our next meeting because Amy didn't just do all this effort for us. She's also making, making three, I think I heard you make three policy recommendations. Yes. We should maybe consider those. Right. All right. I'm also, um, I know that there's a spreadsheet that's been set up um, to share information related to violations. So I'll be adding comments in that as well for your review during licensing. Well, thank you for your, thank you for your work on this. I, the next, um, we have, the next item is yours too, right? Yeah. <laughs> Let me just get back to the agenda here. Sure. Uh, right, if you well, can read it, we're, we just hit the end of year four of our five-year drug-free communities grant. So I'm gonna provide a very quick snapshot on that. Um, just a little reminder about what DFC funds, the federal DFC can fund um, activities to grow the capacity of the coalition. And I know we have two volunteers. I think I saw Rita and um, Rita Mullen and Mara C. Bailey on tonight um, who are very active members of CIT in general, but volunteers as well. 100% um, of my salary and benefits are come out of the grant, as well as activities to reduce youth use of alcohol, tobacco, vaping, marijuana, and prescri prescription drugs. And I'll just add um, for your own information that tobacco and vaping federally is still lumped in the same category, but in North Reading, we separate it out. So we actually tackle five specific um, substances. Everything we do has to fall within the seven strategies for community change. It's all science-based. It's not a guesswork. And we believe local problems warrant local solutions. And so in addition to the seven strategies, we also focus on increasing protective factors and reducing risk factors, as well as building the capacity of parents to um, build healthy kids. So just a little bit about uh, the shutdown. When I had been in with uh, Chief Murphy and the lieutenants for budget hearing, we talked about all of our spring plans we had for providing outreach and education. And I'm sorry I tell you, we had 34 programs between myself and Laura Miranda that had to get canceled. 
but we did um, have some other successes. We were able to offer prescription drug take back bags that I uh, hand delivered to people who are not able or are willing to come out of their homes during COVID. This allowed them to safely dispose of uh, prescription drugs in the home um, in an environmentally safe way as well. We partnered with the Senior Center to produce resource door hangers. We were able to provide a few and limited presentations, including nicotine cessation uh, programming to the school staff. So if they ever had uh, students who needed to kick vaping or nicotine, they had proper resources, as well as uh, other resources through Laura Miranda. One of our biggest uh, COVID roadblocks though was the collection of data that we do annually. It is required by the federal government that we collect four pieces of data about each of those substances that I mentioned. And I'm sorry to say that although the survey was held, the response was so low that it's not statistically valid. So we're not able, you're gonna see a gap for 2020 on our data reporting. The feds understand that um, it is what it is. It's really unfortunate because this was the year that we had really tackled marijuana and vaping and I was anxious to see those numbers, so. Next year, um, and I get asked all the time, what do I think the impact of COVID is on youth use? And the truth is, it's just guess at this point. We don't have data, and I hate making guesses. So that's been a real uh, setback for me personally in our program. Few accomplishments, though. We did grow the coalition 37 volunteers, and I can't say enough how important the volunteers are to this project. Uh, they are everything, and Chair Marcy Bailey is a wonderful and outstanding leader. Uh, who's been, I think, chair for three out of the past four years, if I'm not mistaken, and I uh, hope she continues. We did hold four public presentations at the school. Those were in partnership with the public school parent associations. They're wonderful. They do all the vetting. They find the speakers, and we pay for them, basically. It's a great partnership. Detective Lucci and I were able to get into the classroom to do some eighth grade blood alcohol content and brain development classes. But unfortunately, COVID hit and we weren't able to get the second semester health kids. So again, that's a gap for us. Laura and Miranda and I became uh, trainers in the 40 developmental assets. We had launched that campaign, hoping that we were going to start a campaign to become an asset rich North Reading. COVID got in the way, but we were able to onboard about 70 public school teachers. And um, hopefully we'll re-kick that off in the spring. Jen Ford took over the youth action team during the summer, which is a big help. Um, those were the kids that did the sticker shock and the shoulder taps that I had mentioned. They also ran a program called the Breezy Bike Bustle to encourage mental health and outdoor health, as well as created their own COVID infographic. So they've been, they've been a lot of fun to work with. Um, we also are able to assist with local vape and tobacco regula regulations. If you remember, um, Representative Jones appointed me to the State Vape Commission, and although we had had several meetings that got halted, but we're able to provide support for various house bills that modernize tobacco, so basically raising fines and taxing vape products comparable to tobacco, as well as ban menthol and mint. So I'm happy to do that. But for me, um, my favorite thing to do is policy writing and advocacy. And um, just as a reminder, every February, I'm able to go to Washington, D.C. and meet with uh, Congressman Moulton, Senator Warren, and Senator Markey on this topic. And I'm super happy to tell you that this, this issue of youth prevention has bipartisan support. So although they send us in, the frontline workers in, to advocate for continued funding, it really isn't necessary. Um, we have wonderful bipartisan support for youth prevention. And oftentimes we get asked instead about that, what we do is how does North Reading incorporate mental health treatment and prevention and enforcement all within a police. <clears throat> it is something that uh, this town should be very proud of. It's, we've been working in this model of having social services built into the North Reading Police Department for several years now. And we have evidence that it works. Specifically, it uh, shortens response times for getting people resources. And it also facilitates communication. You know, when you have me doing in, uh, prevention, Laura doing resources and treatment, and uh, the officers doing enforcement in the same house, it just makes sense. And so oftentimes when I go to Washington, they're asking me questions about that model. And I think it's something that we should be really proud of here, that this is not just something new for us. This is something we've been doing for a while. Um, so what's next? 
as of October 1st, we started our last year of BFC funding, and I can't believe how fast that went. Um, it ends September 30th, 2021. So uh, several months ago, Chair Marcy Bailey began looking at our sustainability plans. And really, we have three options. The first is to apply for another five years of DFC funding. The second option would be to adopt part of our budget in, as the town budget. And the third option would be to rely completely on volunteers. Um, of course, option one is our goal. And so during COVID, um, the majority of my time has been spent researching and writing. Although we scored really high on the last grant, that doesn't mean we're gonna do well on the next one because it's competitive. So a couple of challenges I wanna highlight that if we apply, for, well, when we apply for the next round of funding, um, it does require a match. This has been a requirement the entire time, but it's always been a one-to-one -one match. Starting on year seven, actually, it's gonna be, um, 125% match, and then I believe it goes up to 150% match. That's not really a challenge for us because of how much uh, of the North Reading Police Department resources we can include as part of that match. So I'm not that worried about that one. But one of our challenges is operating it as a new system. We just got moved for, from um, the National Institute of Health over to the CDC. So I'm having to learn all new systems, including um, grant submission and reporting systems. These are not easy systems to learn. They've never been easy systems. And I think I'm on my fifth project manager now in five years. Continues to be a, a challenge. We have been promised better communication and better support. Fingers crossed, because that has really been a struggle for five years. We're not guaranteed funding. Um, so although I mentioned this has bipartisan support, as you know, CDC right now is not very popular. And so because the funding comes through CDC, there is a chance that our, our grant could be cut in any of the years. It goes year to year for appropriations. And the last thing is it is com competitive. And so I wanna explain to you how the grants are awarded. You're scored on a score of one to 100. And what they do is they take the pool of money and they fund everybody who got 100, then all the 99s, the 98s, and they keep going until the money runs out. I believe when we got our last award, we scored a 93. We scored lowest in data collection, so that's what I've been spending the majority of my time on, is strengthening our application in the data collection area. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and just a little bit about the projected timeline. Now, this is if everything is normal. And of course, everything is not normal right now. Um, in fact, they have added three separate waves of DFC funding. It's absolutely crazy. But I'm projecting that it'll be released in January. It'll be due in March. We'll find out midsummer if we got it. And it'll begin either October 1st or October. I've heard rumors of October 31st. Um, and lastly, I just want to give a plug because we are being recorded for our P3 anonymous tips that is 100% funded by the DFC grant and we've received over 100 tips. Um, some related to COVID, some related to uh, drug dealing, some related to online cyberbullying, and across the gambit of things. But this is a public app that everybody can use. It is 100% anonymous. You can download it onto your uh, smartphone. If you search P3, Make sure that you download the blue version, not the green version. The blue version, you can remember it as police. You can select it, uh, set it one time for North Reading, your own personal code, and it allows you to communicate directly with detectives, including uploading photo and video, which is great for somebody like me that cannot remember a license plate. And lastly, I always look for an opportunity to tell people that we have Laura Miranda. She is our full-time mental health and substance abuse clinician. She can be reached by phone or email or through <clears throat> detective, excuse me, any of the police officers have her information. And uh, I always want to put that out there. And that is it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. So is there, are there any questions? Any, any of the members have any questions? Mr. O'Leary, all set? Mr. Studo? Yep, I have a question. Um, and Amy, I know you touched on this a little bit, like, you know, the million dollar question is, um, how is COVID affecting students and whether or not that is um, leading to more substance abuse, especially in the 
you know, more high school. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm not saying anybody, but you know, where you would typically see it. So the thing is, is there any way to, and I don't know if the school could, you know, if the school district and committees are already doing this, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I haven't been in the last couple of meetings there that they have just to even listen in, but is there something we can do or where we start tracking if the, unfortunately we, we have to do the things a certain way, the safe way. And it looks like the hybrid model is going to be here to stay for a while. So is there any way to track if that lack of, you know, the social part, which is so big for kids of all ages in general. I mean, it, have you guys thought about any strategy of actually trying to get some data on it? So, because I feel like a lot of the time it's, well, we got to get the kids back in school because, well, we, they want to see their friends and play together. But I feel like, I think a lot of people have this idea that there may be more to it. And I wonder if you can get us some data on that if possible. That is going to be a million dollar grant. Somebody's going to write to study, <laughs> <laughs> um, to be honest with you. And what I've learned, so my training partners are across the United States. So the training partners I'm closest with are in Missouri. We're very good friends, as well as a tribal nation in Idaho and Fort Bragg in California. And I've learned that it is regional. Um, and so where there's some school of thought of with reduced access. So those rural communities, for example, they can't go anywhere. They have seen a drop. Um, but for us, what we're not able to really get a, a um, good grasp on is, uh, is that affecting North Reading specifically or even the Northeast region? I think that uh, we are looking to become part of a collaboration in Northeastern Massachusetts to look at that. But currently we have a plan in April to do our data collection. I hate waiting till April, um, but yeah. until then we really have no way of knowing that. But one trend that I have seen emerge is the increase of access via older siblings. Hmm. That's anecdotal. I'll be honest with you. But we uh, get a lot of that P3 tips that I mentioned. We get tips that way where their older siblings are, are um, providing substances, if not for self-use, but to sell as well on social media. In some cases, okay. I'm tell you the parents are involved in that as well. Wow. Okay. All right. So, all right. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So it's almost like, okay. Yeah. I, and again, I asked more because I feel like that's a, uh, I mean, the outlet, the outlet for, I don't know, I don't want to call it antisocial behavior, but I feel like when you look at, you know, when you just look at some of the symptoms of, of kids that are really antisocial at no fault of their own, it seems like, the path of substance abuse, it, it becomes a lot wider. Yeah, and you know, one of the things I think plays a role here, if this had been 30 years ago, we'd have a different answer. Because what we know is when kids don't communicate about substances, you know, peer pressure and peer information of sharing is a, is a very real thing. <clears throat> that is not a factor now because of social media. Okay. So we've had parents who say like, oh, I don't think my kid's finding out about vaping now. <laughs> I, I guarantee you they have. Um, it's on all of the platforms. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a lot, it's a lot more powerful than, you know, Marlboro billboards, you mm -hmm. know, in the 80s. So, okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. You know, you answered the question. I was just, I figured there was it's something okay. going on. It just that it's always, instead of asking someone who has no idea, I'd ask somebody who actually gave me an answer that makes sense, not just something that <laughs> you know, read on a thread. I'm glad. Know. Okay. Thank you. All right. I look forward to North Reading participating in that study, if we get the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Gonzalez, questions, comments? No, Amy was very thorough. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Walner? I'm good. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Very informative. Thank you, and I'll, I believe I'll see you again for the um, hearing on the other violations as well down the road. Okay. That sounds good. Keep up the great work <laughs> for, for our town. Thank you for the support, and really thank you to all the volunteers that work on this. They're amazing. Yes, thank you. All right, our next order of business is the second reading of the buy recycle policy. And this is why I think Mr. Greenberg has been hanging on, was hanging on waiting and still with us. <laughs> Jill awake. 
<laughs> All right, so we have this in our packet at page, Mr. Gilberta, do you know what page it is? Page 30. Thank you. I'm all the way to 42, so. Okay. And when last we met, we did our first reading. And it, were there any um, specific changes made based on our first discussion, Mr. Gilberto? Uh, no, Madam Chair. I did review the, the minutes and the video from our discussion, and um, you know, I heard some very good feedback regarding the commitment to the policy, but it did not appear to me that there was any further changes that were required. I think the document before you reflects um, our intention and our capabilities um, while also incorporating what is acceptable to the policymakers at the state level. So um, I wanna thank Mr. Greenberg for his work to sort of get us right to that spot where I think we're able to proceed with this. Okay. Mr. Greenberg, any input? You're, you're here, you might, as well, you might as well speak on it. Um, th thank you for your patience. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> well, it's, my job was easy to just sit. You guys, I, you, I keep getting blown away by how patient and thorough you people are. And just on behalf of the town, I, again, I wanted to thank all of you for your hard work. Um, I'll be very brief because I, I don't think it needs much discussion. Um, this is a good idea, it's a good policy, but my motivation for bringing it before the board is that it's a necessary requirement for applying for an IQ grant from DEP that will allow us to educate our residents as to what should go into our recycling bids and what shouldn't. Very important issue, as I've mentioned before, JRM's contract comes up for renewal next June. This is gonna have our ability to clean up our recycling stream, which desperately needs it, will dramatically affect financial matters having to do with that contract. So I very much appreciate the board considering it. Thank you. Any discussion? And Mr. Gilberto, do we need to actually read it for the second reading? The board has not customarily done so, and I give you particular credit for having read it the first time. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think that the, I don't think it needs to be read again, especially where it's unchanged. All right. Mr. O'Leary, your thoughts. You're on mute. More people appreciate that than, you know, than I am on mute. Uh, no, it, Dan, you and your group, thank you again for, uh, your efforts bringing this to our attention, I think it's this is an easy step that we should be taking and look forward to uh, to endorsing it. And, um, and you're right, the public education on uh, our recycling just needs to be stepped up a bit and that's certainly gonna impact uh, the contracts going forward. So let's go for it. Okay, thanks Mr. O'Leary. Mrs. Gonzalez? I I'm so thrilled to see this happening. Um, and I can't say enough about education, education, education. I mean, even myself, I'm learning. Um, I just learned that you're not supposed to take the caps off of the water bottles, which I've always done. Just thinking that that, that was a good thing. And it's not because the caps can get caught up. So, you know, there's just all these little things that we need to know and learn. So um, I'm thrilled with this. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Studo? Anything? You're all set? Mr. Mr. Walner, anything? I didn't know about the caps either. Right? <laughs> so keep the education coming because I'd yeah. like to be compliant, you know? And I, and I take responsibility for training my household. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So do we have a motion? I think, oh, Mr. Calverto. I know he's hiding behind the... Uh screen being shut off, but Mr. Deming has also been very active in the conversations with Mrs. Gonzalez, Mr. Greenberg and I, um, you know, not just for this, but for some other issues we're trying to figure out for trash and recycling collection as well. So I do want to recognize them. Thanks, Chris. Absolutely. Yes, thank you, Mr. Deming for your work on this. So are we good to adopt? We think, I think we might have a motion in there. Yep, Madam Chair, I move to hold the second reading of the buy recycled policy into adopt the policy. Okay. Second. 
Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. That's it. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and good night. <laughs> all right. Our next order of business. Is to re is review and approve calendar year 2021 Medicare health insurance plans. Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, this is, uh, I think, a pretty straightforward one. Um, we've got a renewal for our Blue Cross Blue Shield and uh, Tufts Medicare plans, which is mostly for, um, for our retirees. Different than the um, active employee plans, these plans run on a calendar year basis, so we are generally before you this time of year. Sometimes we've been here having to have difficult conversations relative to the plan design in order to try to get the premium down to a manageable level. Fortunately, this is not one of those years. Um, the renewal rate for the Blue Cross plan was a 0.6% increase, and the renewal rate for the Tufts plan was a 4.01% increase. Both are within our projections for um, the um, budget during the current fiscal year, and we are recommending the board vote to approve the rates. Great. We did review this with the Insurance Advisory Committee, um, and the um, retiree representative was uh, in attendance at that meeting last Thursday, so they are aware that this is um, what's pending. Okay. Any questions? Mr. Studo. I just have a quick question. So do we, and I just don't, um, for, for current employees and retirees, it's um, the town pays the 100% of the cost of the premium? Or is there a sharing? I, I I don't know. I've never. I've always been private sector, so I don't know. So the, the share is a fifty percent, fifty percent split for our Medicare plans, which is the ones that you're voting on right here. That is the I believe the maximum allowed um, under state law, in terms of our, the ability for us to pay the uh, the town share. Um, the um, the active employees, it's a seventy percent share paid by the town and a thirty percent share paid by the employee. That is not part of this group though. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Do we have a motion? Yes. Madam Chair, I move to approve the calendar year 2021 Medicare health insurance plan. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. Next order of business is the, oh, I'm sorry, hold on a second. Um, approval, approve the fiscal year 2021 health insurance premium credit. Madam Chair, through you, there is a, a mistake in the way that's presented. There, there is no vote that's required by the, the board on this. Um, what has happened is because of um, lower than anticipated costs and utilization, Blue Cross Blue Shield has been issuing um, a, uh, a credit to its uh, plan subscribers, including us, the town of North Reading. That credit amounted to $91,249.37 and will be applied um, uh, at a bill um, either this month or next month. There is a share of that that is the town's, um, roughly 70% of it, just using the round numbers of the way our plan's paid for. And roughly 30% is a share that goes uh, to our employees, has paid, been paid by our employees. So we will be working to credit our employees, most likely um, on a payroll in December um, with uh, what's known as a, a basically a premium reduction where the credit will be applied against what they normally expect to pay for a deduction out of payroll. Um, and in terms of the town share, that will result in some uh, funds unexpended uh, out of the fiscal year 2021 health insurance budget uh, in similar fashion to how the PFA operates where what's been accrued but not spent is left over at the end of the year. Um, so some more good news on health insurance. Um, I, I, I'm a little concerned that it may be the last of the good news on health insurance as we look towards the renewal next year, but uh, it is good news and good news not just for the town but for its employees as well. Thank you. There is no question. vote that's required. All right. Any questions? 
Seeing none, we are going to review. Next order of business is to review the list of committee appointments to be advertised, and it's pretty numerous. These are for these are vacancies on committees for the town, well, our, which we are all vol volunteers, mm -hmm. and that will be um, after completion of the citizen activity form, which is on the town's website, www.northreadingmass.gov or contacting the town administrator's office for a paper application, um, 978-664-6010. And the forms must be submitted no later than Monday, November 23rd, 2020 at 4 p.m. Mr. Gilberto, will this, these, there are multiple boards listed in your, in the packet, the Board of Appeals, the Commission on Disabilities, the Conservation Commission, the Cultural Council, Economic Development Committee, Forest Committee, Hillview Commission, Historic District. It looks like you listed every single one of our boards and commissions. Are those going to be advertised just generally? They will be advertised on the town website in the North Reading transcript and then uh, publicized via our uh, social media platform on Facebook as well. And um, these are not only the appointments of the select board, but the appointments of the town administrator as well. Um, the practice has been to advertise any position which is coming up um, as uh, appointment or reappointment. So you'll see all of them are there. There may not, there, there may be candidates for reappointment who apply for these, um, and, and there often are candidates for reappointment who apply for these positions. Um, but uh, this is the list, and, it, and I've uh, already told Mrs. Uh, Ms. Doherty to expect that we'll be submitting it to her tomorrow. Um, you know, so this was just intended to highlight that we'll be advertising it to let the community know that there is a deadline upcoming for appointments that are traditionally made in December. Uh, there is a secondary component of this, which I know we've had some previous discussion about, which is uh, assessing the work of the committee and making any determination that there needs to be any, um, you know, change or, or, or other issue. So this would be the opportunity to discuss that. Um, I will tell you, I'm not aware of any such concerns. Um, none of the board members have expressed anything to me individually, but I did you know, before we advertise this, wanted to make sure I provide that opportunity for the board members. Mr. Gilberto, on the yeah. list of these committees, which is just every committee that we have, are any of those, do, do you have an idea of how many vacancies need to be filled on each of those? Um, so, I, the, I, I do have access to the information. I don't, I don't have it off, off the top of my head. Um, I, I would be reading it from the board and commission information center that the town clerk maintains. Um, this is not all of the committees. These are only the ones for which uh, uh, there's either a vacancy or a current term that is expiring. Oh, so the list in the packet, it looks like there's... It's most of them. <laughs> it just may not be yes. all of them. Yeah, it may not be the ones that, because some of these don't have vacancies on them right now. No, they have candidates whose terms are expiring though. Okay, so you're just gonna re-advertise in blanket fashion for so but uh, i think that you would be um we also keep citizen activity forms on for a year right so gotcha. how are you going to address the citizen activity forms that were already filed by people interested in these different boards and commissions so they are forwarded to the liaisons and to the board for consideration when appointments are made if somebody's applied within the last, I believe it's three years. So you'll be going back and looking at, you know, anybody that's expressed an interest on the various committee. That's correct. That has a vacancy. Okay, great. All right. Does anyone have any questions? I guess, do we get a list of who has applied for a particular committee? You do as they, you generally, as they come in, uh, Mr. Walner, we will forward you as a liaison, um, the citizen activity form for a candidate who is interested in reappointment. And then my, my understanding is that the members normally will, the liaison for the particular committee will have a conversation with um, the candidate, um, any candidate for reappointment who applies as well as um, the chair of the, uh, the committee or commission. Um, at least that's my understanding of how board members have traditionally handled it. I, and I'll, 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 I'll email I'll email because on the form it usually has an email contact on there. So 
Um, did you have any other questions, Mr. Walner? Well, I guess I'm just asking is, I mean, is, was I supposed to have been collecting them throughout the year or do you? No, uh, yeah, the short answer is no, you don't, you don't need to. Um, as if, if, they, uh, if they come in here, we, would be, we may be holding them to provide to you um, so that you see them along with anything that comes in after we advertise it. We also have some okay. that have been uh, on file for up to three years that we'll also provide you. Um, and that's all work that will happen over uh, roughly the next six to eight weeks leading up to uh, appointment or reappointments um, in the, one of the two meetings in December. So can we get a, a timeline of this type of stuff so we can be prepared? Sure. So the timeline is in the, uh, the ad. Um, it'll get posted on Thursday. The uh, applications are due at the end of, uh, I believe November 23rd was the date that I saw on there. Um, and as they're coming in, we'll be forwarding them to you. You'll have the opportunity to discuss with the candidates. Um, and Ms. Brooks has also texted me that you'll also be getting separately a, a note of the expiring term, so your committees as well. So you'll know what's coming up okay. amongst your membership. Um, but what we try to do is when we get an application in, we'll try to get it to the liaison so that you're not getting a bunch of information dumped on you on November 23rd to then have to follow up on. Um, but one thing that you could certainly consider doing in the background is, you know, to the extent you're able to have conversations with the chairs of the committees to which your liaison, um, that's something I would encourage the board members to do um, if they have any questions or concerns about the board uh, or about an interested candidate for either appointment or reappointment. Any other questions, Mr. Walner? No, thank you. Mrs. Gonzalez? Um, just hoping it goes a little smoother this year than it did last year. A little, um, a little, a lot of confusion last year. So hoping it goes smoother. Good luck, Mr. Vincenzo. <laughs> yeah, I had, I, I'll just jump back in. I had promised to review the procedures, which is right behind me by two feet. So that's still on my docket and I'll plan to look at that now, now that we're coming up to it because we should be treating our volunteers like precious assets, you know? It was so lucky to have them on our serve on our boards. We gotta, you know, we gotta treat them with utmost respect and care and can't let a procedure get in the way of making that happen. So I think that's what we, you know, in, in one occasion at least we fell apart on that from my point of view. Okay. Um, any other questions? Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, I, I think it's important that uh all the members of the board are on the same page in relation to how we're going to uh, proceed because last year was an embarrassment, like, quite frankly. Um, you know, it, it should be clear that the liaisons are responsible for communicating with the chairs of the respective liaison committees, uh, consult with them in relation to, you know, how are we going to interview the applicants, whether it be jointly, singly, severally, how are we going to do it? And then, um, it needs to be clearly articulated to the board what the liaison's recommendation is and what the chair's recommendation is, uh, because that wasn't what occurred uh, last year, and it created a lot of confusion, a lot of heartburn, and it was totally unnecessary and avoidable. Uh, so I, I think collectively here, we should agree as to how this is gonna proceed. If we need to memorialize it in the, you know, in our, in our policy document, then again, recognizing that policies are sometimes ignored, uh, at least it should be memorialized here, we're all on the same page. So the, you know, as a liaison is gonna be making a recommendation, the liaison is also going to inform the board, you know, what the chair's recommendation was if the chair can't be present, you know, with the board. I mean, our policy right now says that appointments at a board meeting with committee chairpersons and nominees. This basically says that, you know, the nominees have to be here, the chairs have to be here. And, you know, the, to me, that's a little bit overly cumbersome at times, particularly when we, we're limited on the number of applicants that we have, so it isn't really necessary. Um, but it, it is important for all of us to understand what the needs of the, each committee, board committee and commission is, and what the chairperson of that board committee and commission is recommending to us as a board, as well as the liaison. And again, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's gonna be in concert. So again, my practice has been to convey what my recommendation is and the board chair's recommendation. And I would ask the same courtesy be afforded by every other, every other member of the board too. 
Um, Ms. Sister, do you have any questions? Do you have any questions? No, I got to review film. <laughs> All set. So those will be advertised. Um, getting back to the topic on the agenda, those will be advertised in the paper as well. Correct. Yes. And when will that go out, do you think, Mr. Gilberto, with the deadline? It'll go to the paper on uh, tomorrow morning and it will be advertised in Thursday's edition of the newspaper, is my understanding. And uh, it will also this week uh, go up on the town website and on social media. The board has a policy that it will not make any appointments um, for um, um, without having a 30 day uh, notice uh, period, um, which we're complying with by doing this. And uh, we generally begin making, um, you know, uh, putting on the agenda the appointments or reappointments in the first meeting in December. Right, and thank you to Jane too, because she's pretty on top of making sure we're on top of getting that squared away. Um, and she gives us, you know, she's, <laughs> I think she starts out at the beginning of December, reminding us, you know, we have a couple of weeks to get this squared away to reach out to the prospective appointees and reminding us all that this is the appointing authority. So the ultimate decision comes down to the majority of the board on a, a liaison appointment. So, um, so we'll look forward to seeing that and hopefully look forward to seeing plenty of new volunteers, new faces, new volunteers this round. The um, next order of business is the approve the legal bills. Mr. Studo? Yes. We have at least one or two motions on that. Madam Chair, I move to approve legal bills for August 2020 in the amount of 13,646.01 as follows. 91, ooh, read this phone. 910251, 4212 for labor, and 33150 for Elm Street for a total of 13,646.01. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And Upelli is aye. Was it just one motion, Mr. Studo? Or did you have a second one? That's it. it. <clears throat> Our next order of business is minutes, September 21st, 2020, regular and executive session, October 3rd, 2020, regular session, which was our town meeting, our meeting before the town meeting meeting. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to approve the September 21st, 2020, regular session meetings as written. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Minu Pelli is aye. Madam Chair, I move to approve the September 21st, 2020 executive session meeting minutes as written. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, seconded by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. <laughs> Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. And Madam Chair, I move to approve the October 3rd, 2020 regular session minutes as written. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Well, uh, just discussion. It really didn't indicate how well and how smoothly the town meeting went. <laughs> no. Other than that. No. I, yeah, all right, Mr. Early, Mr. Studo. I abstain. I wasn't, I don't. Oh, that's right. <laughs> we are, we're going to record you as abstain. Mr. Walner. Uh, aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And Minya Pelli is aye. Yes, and thank you to everybody, public facilities, everybody that took part, all the volunteers, the superintendent, all the school personnel, all the, all the extra department heads that were there to help us make that one happen too. All right, the next order. I didn't, I didn't mean to be critical of whoever was taking the notes for the minutes, but Mr. Town Administrator, <laughs> you did a fine job. <laughs> I didn't live up to Jane's standards, but <laughs> my best. Uh, all right, our next order of business is the Town Administrator's Report. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple of things I'd like to note this evening. The first is that the, there will be a um, uh, drug and uh, vape take back day on Saturday, October 24th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Senior Center in the front parking lot. And this is an opportunity for folks to dispose of things that might be in their medicine cabinet or otherwise um, safely so that doesn't get into the improper hands. Um, it's gonna be run in a drive up fashion um, at the Senior Center, again, this Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And we do have information about it up on the town's website as well as on our social media page. Um, and then secondly, uh, I just wanna give an update relative to some uh, important public works collection and recycling information. I know that there's a number of these things that we've normally done that got delayed, but I do wanna recognize the DPW, including uh, Mr. Deming, um, Ms. Dechara and, um, and Jenny in the office as well for their efforts uh, to pull this together here. Um, so I'm just gonna take it in order and this information is up on the town website, but there will be a rigid plastic dumpster located at the DPW facility on Halloween, Saturday, October 31st from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. So uh, anybody with uh, rigid plastic items, so sort of the you know old trash barrels, the things that are uh, hard plastic that are not suitable for recycling at the curbside collection, but are suitable for recycling in general, folks can bring those down to the DPW on Saturday, October 31st. There will be a curbside collection of scrap metal on Saturday, November 7th. You should have items curbside by 6.30 a.m. Please note no appliances, chain link fence, or propane tanks. And for those who don't know, we do have a scrap dumpster still at the DPW yard, um, which uh, items can be deposited in um, pretty much at any point in time. Um, curbside collection of yard waste, important for those who are looking to dispose of grass clippings, um, small branches, and leaves. Saturday, November 21st, and Saturday, December 5th, waste must be curbside by 6.30 a.m. and the um, the, the only bags that may be used for that are plastic, uh, excuse me, paper bags, not plastic bags, paper bags only. Um, no barrels, branches must be less, uh, no greater than three inches in diameter and cut the lengths of no more than three feet. And they must be bundled and tied, but not bagged. The compost center, again, a very busy season uh, coming up on us here. Uh, it is open Saturdays um, until from 8 a.m. until 4 p.m. and then beginning Sunday, November 1st. It will be open Sundays in November from noon to 4 p.m. Uh, for disposal of leaves, uh, leaves or brush or grass clippings. And then finally, something that does not get a whole lot of attention, but we hope that the community is aware of is that residents may drop off oil waste at the DPW garage the last Saturday of every month from April to November between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 a.m. and noon um, at the garage. So thank you for the folks at DPW for putting that together and getting that out. Um, finally, um, it's not in here, but I know it's late breaking. We, we do believe we're gonna be able to pull off a household hazardous waste day this fall on November 14th at the DPW garage. So we just ask folks to keep an eye out for information on that. I know that's something we were really hoping we could pull off and I think we're gonna be able to do it. So I just, again, wanna recognize Chris and the staff for trying to get that done. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Mr. Gilberto. Any questions? All set, we can move on to old and new business. Mr. O'Leary. Just gonna be a broken record. Vote, you know, get out there, um, participate. I don't care what side of the, the fence you're on or what your persuasion is. You know, this is our opportunity to, to be heard. Uh, the impact is gonna be significant. Uh, let's get our frustration levels down and get things uh, resolved and solved and uh, let's move forward. So uh, vote by mail. Early vote or vote on election day, but please participate. Thank you. That's it. Yes, here, here. All right, Mr. Studo. Nothing. <laughs> I can't believe you're still awake. Yeah, right. <laughs> Mr. Walner. I'm good. Thank you very much. All right, Mrs. Gonzalez. All set. And just congratulations to. Mr. and Mrs. Studo, which we started out with. So, and I got, uh, we have a motion to adjourn. I, 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 I have second shift after we adjourned. <laughs> oh, no, uh, oh no. it's a good thing we kept you awake then. No, no that's fine. Uh, motion to adjourn. All right. <laughs> motion to adjourn, second by Mr. O'Leary. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. Good night, folks. All right, good night. Good night, Rita. <laughs>